Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to this meeting of the Preservation Board. This is our November meeting. And we will have discussion at the end of this meeting about timing for our December meeting. Let me, to begin the meeting, call a roll and establish the presence of a quorum. Commissioner Richardson, are you here? Commissioner Allen, are you here? Commissioner Hamilton, are you here? Here. Commissioner Gilbert, are you here? Here. Commissioner Robinson, are you here? Alderman Coder, are you here? Here. Commissioner Colleen, are you here? Present. Callow is present. That's five commissioners present. And the order that I'll be calling the roll tonight is Richardson, Allen, Hamilton, Gilbert, Robinson, Coder, Colleen, and Callow. The chair will vote to break ties or make ties if necessary. Meg, have you got housekeeping details to tell people about? Yes, uh, the meet, this meeting is being recorded. And if you wish to speak, please put your full name in the chat, first name and last name, and the address of the agenda item to which you, on which you wish to speak. Please note that comments made in the chat do not count towards the public record. So if you want something on the record, you need to say it verbally during the meeting. Um, and uh, preservation board members, if you have to, when you make or second a motion, if you're not on camera, please do let us know that it's you so we can be sure to get accurate notes for tonight's meeting. Great, and would everyone who is not a commissioner, please mute unless you're presenting. Okay, let's take a look at the agenda commissioners. Um, we have, two and a half commissioners who tell us that they have hard or soft stops today. So I propose that we hear the appeals of director's denials first, and that up inside the director's denials, we hear those that have urgent time clocks first, and those with less urgent clocks second. And the agenda item would be then H I E F G, J, K, and then we would proceed to preliminary reviews. Anybody have a problem with that? Okay. Mr. Chairman, thank you. Before, yes. before we begin, I'm sorry, we've had some issues with um, the chat going to the right place. If you could please, if you wish to speak, please send it to the chat for the, um, that says staff-cultural resources office. We have we have some that are that have been sent directly to um, to me, and we will make sure that all your names are taken. But in, for anybody else who wishes to speak, please direct chat staff dash cultural resources office. Thanks. Cool. Do, do commissioners need to recuse themselves from any of these items? Uh, item C, recuse. Item A for me, Chairman. So who just spoke? I I, I wasn't looking up. That was code or was it oh, item A? Well, thank you. Yeah, Jack A, I'm C. This is Mike Killeen. Okay. And Commissioner Killeen, you told me that agenda item B has been dropped from the agenda? Right. Yes, sir. Great. We will check for conflicts again as more commissioners arrive. Has any commissioner read the minutes from October the 24th? And if so, does the commissioner have a motion? Okay, hearing I, no motion. I can motion to approve. It's Hamaker. Okay, there's a motion on the floor to approve the minutes for October the 24th, 2022. Is there a second? I'll second that. <laughs> the hell. Catherine, I, I was sort of hoping your motion to approve the minutes would die without a second. <laughs> Are there any changes proposed for the agenda? Hearing none, all those in favor of approving the agenda for, sorry, excuse me, the, the minutes. minutes for October the 24th, 2022, signify by saying aye. Aye. Um, opposed? Abstain. Okay, the, min the minutes for October 24th, 2022 are approved. We'll now begin our agenda with 
agenda item H 2752 Armand, which is the most urgent of the, of the appeals before us. And Meg, do you want to combine that with agenda item I? Or Bob? No, they're, they're two separate items, Richard. Okay, let's do agenda I item just, H. Sorry, let me give you one second. Yeah. Sorry, you have to bear with us. We're having some, some chat issues on our end, so please bear with us if you would. Take your time. There'll be plenty of stress in this meeting. We don't need to begin with it. Well, it's a good thing you got me because I love stress. Let me tell you. Sorry. Okay, we need to just do some quick house cleaning here. One second. Dave Sweeney, is that you barking? Not yet. <laughs> Not yet. <laughs> Are you reserving the right to bark, Mr. Sweeney? <laughs> Absolutely not, Councilor. Okay, sorry about that. We had to just take care of something really quickly. Okay, okay. Uh, this is Bob Bettis with staff and I swear to tell the truth. Uh, the first item uh, is 2752 Armand Place. I need to enter in the enabling ordinance 64689 as amended by 69423. And then the Fox Parks ordinance, which is 66098, my presentation and my staff report. Can you all hear me okay? Yes. Okay, great, yeah. just make sure. We had some, some muting going on, so. Okay, uh, this is the, the first item. Uh, this kind of dates back while it's a, a violation case. There were several violations of the property um, back in uh, 2021. And we'll kind of kind of go through uh, point by point each of the violations. Um, we sent a letter to the homeowner. Uh, it was our, according to our records, it was based out of Illinois. We did not hear from the owner when we had the, the complaint sent out. So eventually we had to send out a summons for housing court. At that time, the applicant did get the summons and then they call staff to kind of begin the process of working through the various issues at the property. So I'm just gonna kind of go through this with you. Um, here's the property in question. Um, as you see on the right is the original condition. On the left is the current condition. So here is the uh, context on Armand and Fox Park. We're just north of Fox Park itself. Here is uh, some street level context looking east and looking west. It's a very intact block, kind of a mix of uh, conditions, um, uh, historically some modifications to properties over time. So um, as I said before, there were several items that were violations. So I'm gonna kind of just kind of go through point by point and uh, tell you where we're at. Um, the first item were the front porch columns. Um, you know, I'm just going to kind of go through point by point, and then the owner can kind of go through the background as to what happened. And then at the end of this, I'm going to kind of do a quick summary of our meetings and, as we discuss each of these items. Um, so this is the first item is the, the porch columns. As you can see, the original stone columns on the left were removed. These are kind of a, on the right are precast columns. The, um, the details lost at the capital level. We... Um, so we, uh, so there's a different shape to it. Um, the intestines to the columns are different. The base of the, the columns are different. Um, so this is the, that's the first item. The next are the uh, second and third floor windows. Um, as you can see at the third floor level, um, the dormer window used to be a, a leaded glass uh, window and now it's a slider window. 
The other windows appear to be vinyl windows. <clears throat> um, they are, that's not compatible with the standards. Uh, the, I think the most um, obvious um, uh, violation is the, the windows. On the left is original window. On the right <clears throat> is, the, is the, the new window. <clears throat> Excuse me one second. <clears throat> So as you can see, we've lost all the framing. Uh, we have a new, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, one second, guys. Got a frog in my throat. Sorry about that, guys. Okay, and so this is the first door window. You can see the modification that's in place as well. And then we have the front door. As you can see in the front door, uh, we have a new kind of a modern um, Art Deco style door that's been in filled with a new frame. Um, detail on the sideboards have been filled in. Uh, the transom itself has kind of been locked down a bit to fit this new stock door. And so we're back here to the, um, the before and the after. When the owner got the summons, he did call us, and we did begin to kind of work the process of how to fix these violations. Um, he says he's made efforts to contact various craftsmen to kind of get through this, but he's been unsuccessful on like the front door and then also to the front, the first floor um, window. Uh, it's um, uh, more expensive to obviously go back to what there for. So, um, it's in court right now, and the court is waiting for us to, well, the board, to make a determination on the applicant's request for exceptions to the code. Um, Fox Park has declined to comment on any residential um, cases, so we have no comment from them in regards to this request. So, um, you know, given the obvious issues here, oh, there's oh, one more issue, I apologize, I forgot to mention. If you look at this photograph here, the rooftop deck, um, there was an existing rooftop deck before the applicant modified it with a new handrail system, which also makes it more non-compliant um, uh, with the standards. Rooftop decks are not supposed to be street visible, and this has obviously been made more street visible by the new handrail system. So we have columns, doors, windows, and handrail systems for the deck, and those are the, the all the items that are not compliant with the code. Uh, obviously, staff is recommending that you uphold the director's denial of all of these items. And I'm um, happy to answer your questions. There's a lot of them, I'm sure. Commissioners, questions? Hey, Bob, Mike here. Is that stair railing they put at the front porch? Is that compliant? It, it'd be okay. It's a simple metal on, on a concrete, yeah. on, on a, a masonry porch, so it'd be okay. Did they change out the cap there at the top of that porch wall, or did they just paint it black? It's they're painted black. And that's right, I, I did neglect that. I apologize. I, I kind of blew through that, and I apologize. There's a couple other items as well um, in, in terms of stonework. You'll notice the sills for the windows have been capped as well. Uh, there was a, a, a stone element at the bottom of the, the arch on the first floor window that has been capped with, um, I, I believe, some aluminum and a, a little letter R. So those elements as well, um, you can't cap those items. So those are also not compliant as well. Okay. I'm sorry, did they extend the rooftop deck? I, I can it's definitely yeah, it's, more it's visible. Just that, yeah, I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, just tell me what they do up there on the rooftop deck. They replace the handrail, so they made they put a new handrail up there that was taller. Okay. We was I mean, did, was any of this work permitted? No, sir. No. Um. And and the uh, the applicant is here. He can kind of go through with his backstory as to how we got here. But none of the work um, was permitted. You would need permits, building permits for the. Um, the front porch columns, as well as the handrail system, hand rail system on the rooftop deck. So those items would need a, a building permit. The other items would simply be a permit for our office. Well, what about the windows? Those would need a permit, right? Build it's through cultural resources. Oh, gotcha. Okay. Yeah. Not a building permit. For the questions. Okay, thank you. Let's hear from the appellant. Mute. Can everybody hear me okay? Yeah, there it is. Is that positive? Everybody can hear me? Yeah, we can hear you, Ray. Go ahead. Okay, awesome. I purchased a property on December 19th of 2019. Okay, on the 23rd, I had hired a contractor, went down and got a permit 
to do the roofing on the home. Okay, they're the ones who took down the deck and going, there was no change in height of the deck. So I'm not sure where that came from. It's, it's absolutely the same as before. And that was one of the reasons we purchased the home. About four or five days into that process, replacing the roof, the contractor left tools and stuff inside the house and somebody decided that they needed the tools more than we did and broke through the front door, which we made reparations to. That happened on two more occasions over the next two months. The last time that it happened, we were preparing to move into the property and we felt that it wasn't safe to continue to use that door or the front windows, which was not in compliance, the large picture window, because it's basically all plexiglass that had been pushed through and people were crawling through it prior to us living there. Now you folks have to keep in mind that, that initially we tried to follow the rules and regulations and get permitting and whatnot, but unfortunately this was when COVID was going on, those offices were not available. You know, so we changed the door and yes, we did change the windows. And if you look at the columns, you know, they were not safe. So I changed them. I mean, I have no desire to, you know, be confrontational with anybody or not have my house within COVID, but I also have a strong desire for my home to be safe. And I think any reasonable person would say and understand the, you know, the process of these things being changed. Unfortunately, when I was notified by the preservation board or what off, office that Bob represents, the letter went to my shop. It wasn't received by me, but I'm responsible for it being received. I don't know if that makes any sense or not. Basically, it went to my shop manager, signed for it, left it on his desk, didn't forward it to me, and he quit. So it sat on his desk for a long time. The next letter that I got, which was very upsetting, was, of course, the letter from the court saying that we have issues. I mean, I've, I've done a great amount of research, and I have a better fundamental understanding of what's required and what we should do here. But quite frankly, when I ask questions about what exactly needs to be done, I really don't get definitive answers. You know, and it was suggested to me by Mr. Bettis that we approach you and say, look, at, let's ask about a variance before we do anything because of, you know, some of these items are very expensive and going. And it's a financial burden. I'm 61 years old. I'm going to retire in May. You know, I would like the peaceful enjoyment of my home. I like doing things to my home. Obviously, I want to do them correctly. And obviously, I want to do them within the, the structure of what's going on. But at the end of the day, you know, our desires and our needs and our wants, along with those of, of the community, should all be taken into consideration. This isn't a situation where it, it, it has a simple solution from our perspective anyway. Now we are clearly and totally willing to compromise. We made that perfectly clear in our first visit with Mr. Bettis. You know, we just would need some clear, concise directives on what we can do. And then those things need to be economically viable, obviously. You know, we purchased the worst house on the block and trying to make it into a home. Ray, is there anything else you'd like to introduce for your appeal? Do you have cost estimates? What, what you spent, what you need to spend? I did approach a couple contractors with similar pictures to what's provided here on replacing the window. I, I did that with three different people. One guy came out, looked at it, said, I'm not interested. Two other guys said they would get back to me. Clearly they did not, did not return my calls. You know, if you inspected the window to begin with, the reason the decision was made was, was really twofold. The thing was basically spray foam, duct tape and, and wire ties holding it together. All the panels except for one were all plexiglass. They were not uh, e even polycarbonate panels. You know, the door was broken on at least three occasions since we owned the home. You know, the columns were sitting there moving around. You know, I did what I did, what I felt like was for the safety of my family. You know, I apologize for the fact that your offices weren't open and I couldn't get help. I got help going right out of the gate, tried to do the best that I could. This is where I'm at. You know, for the privilege of living in this residence, I drive 105 miles one way every day for the pr privilege of, you know, of living here and doing this. I want to be part of the Fox Park community. I want to live here. I want to put these issues behind me. But by the same time, you know, the scale of economy is, is fairly significant in this instance. And do you, do you have any details on what that would be? On the actual cost would be? Yeah. 
I would, I, you know, all, all I can repeat is what the contractor told me when he came out. He said, look, at, you know, you don't buy these things off the shelf. They're 1890 windows. You don't buy them off the shelf. It's going to have to be specially made. And he wouldn't even speculate on the cost. Okay, commissioners, questions for Ray. Uh, Ray, so it's my understanding you're saying this would be a financial burden and you tried your best to contact the offices needed during, but COVID was a huge factor as to why you put it. Yes, actually, we were very fortunate to be able to buy the supplies that we were able to at the time, you know, and we made, we made the decision based, like I said, on need at the time and what was available, what materials were made at, available at the time. Yeah. You know, and, and yes, I'm retiring from a small business that quite frankly, since COVID has not done well, my largest customer unfortunately closed and pretty much decimated my, my business. I went from a, a business of 15 to 18 machinists down to two, you know, and I don't anticipate, you know, a turnaround then before it's my retirement age. Okay. Thank you. You know, I, I also wanted to add that, you know, we are willing to work on these things and try to get the home. And, and if we can come to some kind of agreement that everybody is happy with, you know, we've kind of pulled the neighborhood, we've kind of pulled things on social media and got nothing but favorable responses from those participating. I mean, nobody's come to our home and said, hey, you shouldn't have done this or hey, you shouldn't have done that. It's some silent person somewhere saying, well, this is how things have to be. Thank you. Um, this is more of a question for staff, Mr. Chairman. Was there ever a period, I, I can't remember, there was a period when in your office was actually unreachable during COVID, nor the permit office. Is, is there a period when that, that this, you know, might have happened? Yeah, so I was going to make a point of that. Yeah, I mean, we have no record of our, you know, voicemails or emails from the applicant stating he tried to call our office. I went in person to the courthouse. Right. I'm very, I'm very right. much in person. Right. Yes. Could, yes. Could you let them have that discussion, please? <clears throat> yes. Thanks. Bob? Yeah, so, so, yes, yeah, so we don't have any. Um, we were yeah, we were open the entire time. We have no record of him making contact with our office, but we were open the entire time in one way to perform either by email or we, staff was always available. And, and so the permit the office as well, as I recall. That's correct. Do you have a timeline of correspondence, Bob? We uh, back in November is when we sent the initial um, complaint to his house. So that'd be in November of 21. Uh, but that's before my time. That was previous staff. To his house or to his shop? It was sent to the his shop in Illinois, which is the address on record with the assessor's office. Okay. So um, and then may I interject here? Yes, sir. This work was completed way back in the spring of 2020. It was that's when it was completed before the summertime of 2020, sometime between February and say maybe July of 2020. Thank you, Ray. Bob, continue with the timeline. And then it was uh, then sent to, I started in March. Um, and I sent the, I, I, I sent our letter to the, the applicant again um, when I started and I received no response. So then we then sent the project to Housing Court back in March. And then once I got that, then Ray and I started to have correspondence. I went on site and met with him and his and his wife. Um, you know, uh, did I try to offer some solutions? Um, you know, I tried to work with them as best I could, but I, I never received any kind of, you know, I explained, explained to them the rules and what staff can approve. Staff is, is not, and we can't be, you know, we, we can't make deals. We have to we have to adhere to the code. And so things like the doors and the columns and the windows, I, I can't, there's no middle ground to reach. We we were close on a door situation, but then that kind of fell apart. So, you know, staff, I, I did my best to try to work with Ray. Um, you know, he, he's, he's been cordial to work with, but I, I just, I had a lack of movement to do anything. Commissioners, further questions for the appellant or apparently for staff? I guess question for appellant, what other, I mean, in addition to the exterior work, what other work did you do on the house, um, you know, on the interior and tell me about sort of all in, what are your redevelopment costs here? Oh, my wife never met a surface that she didn't want to refinish. We had uh, taken some of the plaster off the walls where the, the show exposed brick. Uh, we did replaning. We refloored all the floors in the house. We did, uh, 
rearrange some, uh, there was an island in the kitchen and we made the counter go across the island. Um, just a, a plethora of that kind of things. Just, you know, uh, just standard. We didn't do any plumbing. We didn't do any electrical work, things like that. We, it was, you know, strictly decorative kind of things. My wife is an artist. If that if that helps the situation, I mean, and very much an eclectic artist. You know, we have a wall in our home that has moss on it that's decorated, and we have exposed brick walls now and things like that. And we did some tile work in the kitchen on the wall, just things like that. Gotcha. And we just mainly cosmetic work inside. Yeah, we're pretty much we did. We don't. It's not like we tore out, moved any walls or any structural. I'm an engineer, obviously by trade. I own a machine shop. We didn't go get into involved in any of that kind of stuff. We basically do the work ourselves. You know, I, I I'm very um, was very excited about this project. You know, like I said, I I sacrifice a lot for the privilege of living in Fox Park. You know, we want to stay here. We want things to be well. You know, this this is our home. This is kind of a forever. I'm basically trying to retire here and stay here and be a part of the community, you know, and I've had several conversations with Bob, you know, because I feel a little bit, unfortunately, like I'm being vitrified because I can literally stand on my front porch and see violations all around me and nothing being done about those. It's not that I don't care. It's not that I don't understand the importance of these things because I do and I want them to be okay. But at the end of the day, you know, it's not 1890 anymore, guys. You can't go down to the Home Depot, you know, and, and, and buy this window or buy these columns. I tried. You know, it's a very long, arduous process. And to even try to attempt to do that during COVID was very, very difficult because these things were not available. I didn't start out with the intent of meeting with you folks. Believe me, that was not my intent at all. My intent is for the health, well-being, and safety of my family. Nothing more, nothing less. Um, you testified earlier that you started work in February. When did you go to the courthouse to try to get approval for this? It was sometime during that. I, we, we'd finished the roof after we were broke into. My contractor said, hey, what are we doing about my tools? I replaced his tools once. About two weeks later, it happened again. He got all mad. He was a friend of mine. He got all mad. I said, look, I'm not replacing. You're going to have to talk to the insurance company. And he basically walked off the job. You know, we finished those things up and then I'm going to say somewhere, I'm going to say March, maybe April. You know, I didn't keep real good records with that. I went down to the courthouse on purpose, just like he did. That was my knowledge of it at the time. I didn't make any phone calls. You know, Mr. Bettis is correct with that. I didn't have an email to email him to there. You know, and that was it. What, I mean, what it, building What building did you go to? The same one I went to get the permit for. Uh, Mr. Bettis suggested that I get a permit to replace the door. I, I applied to change the door back to original and was denied. I guess that's preface to how we got to where we're at today. So that's city hall or a courthouse? Yes, it's the city hall. City hall, got it. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I, I lived, lived in Southern Illinois for a number of years and I grew up in Northern Illinois. There's just, it's, it's a different process here. I'm just gonna leave it at that. Thank you. Can I clarify one point really quick? He did state that he applied for a permit for the door and was denied. And that is correct because when I said I need to see what the door looks like to make sure it fits the opening correctly, that was not provided. He did submit a simple drawing of the door, but when pressed, I said I need to see the door or you're going to have it, have it milled. That was not provided. So it's not that I was being inflexible. I had to deny it based on what was given to me. Further questions from commissioners? Okay, Bob, is there anybody signed up to speak? No, sir, just, just Ray. Okay. Okay, uh, Ray, what, have you submitted everything that you needed for your appeal? I, do, I don't know what the appeal process is, quite frankly. The, I mean, I... I, the, I appeal, the appeal process is you ask us to overturn a decision made by the preservation, by the cultural resources office and you submit testimony or documents in support of your argument. Okay. I would have to prepare that documentation, sir. Okay, All Alex. Right. Today is the day. May I, have a, may I say something, please? Yes. I've had this discussion with the applicant several mm -hmm. times and stating, if you wish to provide evidence of hardship, please provide it prior to the meeting. This is not a surprise. This has been discussed 
at length. That's, that's not what you asked me. He asked me about the appeal process and my social economic status, you know, all, although important, shouldn't be the contributing factor to what's going on here. I mean, some of the things that I, some of the things that I'm involved in are esoteric things with my business that I prefer not to be public knowledge. I'm sorry. Okay, Ray. I, I, I think that's I, reasonable. I, I, I don't think Bob was meaning to be intrusive. I think what he was pointing out is that under the ordinance, we can offer a variance if you can demonstrate economic hardship. I think that's all he was saying. Now, can, will you tell me that the testimony you gave is the truth? Absolutely. Right. Yes, absolutely. Thanks. I, I should have asked. I should have asked you that at the beginning. I don't usually start with appeals. Commissioners, this concludes the testimony in this appeal. Commissioner Kalini, have you got a motion? Uh, yes, sir. I move the preservation board um, uphold the director's denial as the changes um, do not meet with the Fox Park historic standards. Is there a second? I'll second, second it. Second. Okay, the first second I heard was Commissioner Gilbert's. I note for the record that Commissioner Robinson was present for the discussion. Commissioners, there's a motion on the floor that has been made and seconded is to deny the appeal and to uphold the director's denial. I'm going to call a roll in the order that I indicated. Commissioner Hamilton, do you vote yes or no? No. Commissioner Gilbert, do you vote yes or no? Yes. Commissioner Robinson, do you vote yes or no? Yes. Alderman Carter, do you vote yes or no? Yes. Commissioner Colleen, do you vote yes or no? Yes. The chair abstains on this vote, counts four yeses, one no, one abstention, and the appeal is denied. The director denial is upheld. Thank you, commissioners. Next agenda item that we'll hear is agenda item I, 2643 Armand. I can't tell us, it's a judge. Okay. So the next item, again, Bob Bettis with staff, I'll tell the truth. I need to enter in ordinances 64689 as amended by 69423, Fox Parks Ordinance, which is 66098, my presentation and the staff report. You still see the bar? Okay. All right. Uh, this is also an appeal on Armand. It's a, a block to the east. Um, this is a relatively straightforward one. Um, it centers around the replacement of all the third floor windows. Um, as you can see on the left, they were all originally arched, two on the right, and then one with a Jefferson door on the left. On the right, you see the aftershots of uh, what took place. Um, in August, we received a complaint from CSB. We reached out to the, the owner and she responded right away. She applied for a permit. <clears throat> she stated at that time that it, it would be a hardship for her to replace these windows. I wanna stay up front. Um, there was info forwarded to you all um, from the applicants. You should have a letter as well as some information on some bids that were sent to you in the packet. Um, but it's pretty straightforward. The, um, the ordinance says that you must replicate the windows as they are historically, and you can't modify them. And obviously you can see we have square windows and round openings. Um, the Jefferson window is obviously a, a severe deviation from the original. It really does uh, uh, affect the character of the building in a, a very negative way. Um, and obviously, uh, you know, it, it stands out on the street. So this is the before and after. Just give you some context. We're about a half block off Jefferson. This is your street level context. And there's some close up shots um, of the original windows before the alteration and after. Uh, I did, um, uh, Veronica, I'm sorry, the applicant uh, called and we did send her some information on um, the right kind of windows, kind of give her the direction to be most affordable from our list of approved windows. I do believe that's what is, um, that's the bid in her package. So she did go down that route to try and do that, but she said that she cannot um, uh, replace them based on hardship. Uh, again, Fox Park has declined to comment on this item. 
So given that, um, staff recommends that the board uphold the director denial of the application as the installed windows do not comply with the Fox Park Historic District Standards. Commission, commissioners, questions for staff? Are those front doors the same? Those look different. I think they're painted. There, uh, there is painted, sir, to match the rest of the paint. Mm -hmm. Be worth looking at. I can explore that as well. The, the complaint was for the windows, and that's what I would focus on. I apologize if I missed something. No, no apologies needed. It just looks like a pre-manufactured door went in there. For the questions from staff, for the questions from commissioners to staff. Okay, is the appellant present? Yes, I believe she is here. Let's see, where is she? Veronica? Yes. yes. There she is. Hello. Is, Hello. The, testimony, is the testimony going to give the truth? Yes. Okay, tell us your name. My name is Veronica Galvin. And what do you want us to do? Uh, well, due to the hardship of me, um, I retired in 21 and I and I stopped working due to health issues. And I stated that I've been in this area for 26 years, 27 years. And I was just trying to reflect the area of up, uh, bringing my house up to Parsons in the area that they was doing a lot of home improvement. Uh, I've been with this. I'm, I was also a city employee for 32 years, and I just recently had to look. Re retired due to health issue, and I was at the St. Louis City Justice Center. And I called several companies as far as getting the windows. I, three other companies did respond, but they don't do historic windows. So basically, uh, due to the health issues that, that I was forced to retire, I don't have the funds at this present time. Can you give us some idea on the difference in cost? Uh, well, the one company that uh, I sent you guys, they said 34,000. The other company, which was the uh, River, River, River Time, they said for the first three windows will be a, at least $1,000 a piece. But I will also have to, that's for them to make the windows, but then I have to find someone to put those windows in. I also asked about the windows that were taken out and the man stated that the way that the person took those windows out, he kind of like tore them and it would cost more to even get those fixed, the, the replaceable windows that I do still have. Commissioners, questions for the appellant? Uh, I guess, Ms. Galvin, what did you pay the windows you put in, what did you spend on those? Like 1200 Total? Yes. Okay. And you said one bid was for 34000 It was thirty five. It's, Pel it's uh, Peller's uh, window company. Okay. And then I saw you had a Rivertown bid. What did, what did Dick say the windows would cost? He said each window will be $1,000. That's just for him to make them. And then, and then you'd have to have them installed. Exactly. And then I, I, asked, I asked Rick about the windows that I took out. And he said, but the way that the gentleman ripped them out, it will cost more to get them replaced, repaired. Okay, understood. Nothing. Further questions from commissioners? And I'm sorry, just the evidence that like, I don't know, is there a tax return or something to show that you can't actually pay for those windows? That's not a bad price for replacement windows from Rivertown. But then you also have to pay for getting them installed. He said that's where the price come in at. So, yes, I understand it. Um, but to, to, I guess, be eligible for this hardship thing, we need some kind of evidence like, okay, there's just like, is there a bank account number or something that, or, or some kind of balance that shows you just don't have it? I, I hate to even ask, it's embarrassing to talk about these things, but it's just, you know, otherwise everybody would be applying for this. We need some kind of proof, you know? 
I'll continue the statement that uh, I don't know I work anymore. I'm okay, thanks, ma'am. Further questions from commissioners? No, I, mean, I have a statement. I know we've approved in the past other people that haven't shown us bank statements and gone off their word. So that's just a comment. Let's let's save our comments for discussion. For the questions. Okay. Alderman Coder, have you got a motion? I move to uphold the director's denial. Is there a second? Second. Motion made and seconded. Discussion, Commissioner Hamilton. I mean, I, I, I think due to Miss Galvin retiring, having health issues, how is she going to replace these? How is she going to afford to pick, replace these windows? Um, no one's complaining in the neighborhood, so I just I don't see why we would put this additional burden on on her. She did the research. She says she can prove that um, she had forced retirement due to health issues. In the past, we haven't really, I can think of several times we haven't had people prove to us their bank statements or tax returns. So um, I just don't know how she's going to pay for this. Further discussion? Yeah, um, this is Commissioner. I'm sorry. Go ahead. I'm sorry. I'll come in after. Um, Commissioner Robinson. So, yeah, uh, on piggybacking on what Commissioner Hamilton said, um, I, I will say my concern is that we don't have a standard for financial hardship, and we should, because we have approved previously um, where uh, appellants have come in and simply stated there was a financial hardship, and, and e either we're using that as a baseline so that it is everyone and it is fair and equitable, or we come up with a standard uh, if in fact that is going to be that people produce, you know, pay stubs, tax returns. Uh, and, and, and I believe there should be that standard uh, because otherwise things are not equitable. Yeah, I agree. I mean, we just had the, the last applicant say he couldn't afford it, and we turned him away because he didn't correct, provide, he but, didn't provide but proof. We have, but we have, in fact, approved previously, and so what basis are we doing that on? No, I there agree. Be I agree. Standard. I feel like it's just based on how people feel that day, because there is no standard, and I know, um, I know for a fact we have approved people without just by them saying, "Do you swear?" that you have a financial hardship, yes, okay, overturned. So that's that's my concern. I feel like we need to be fair. Um, and if she's saying that she she was forced out, she worked for the city of St. Louis, she was forced out because of health, you know, she can prove that, then she can prove that and she's not working. How is she gonna, why are we putting this additional burden on her? I just don't understand what we've given people more grace with less, with less issues. So, so expounding on that, I think that we should continue this until um, until the next meeting, allowing her to provide what she just discussed. So I don't know that we can do that for this one, only because there is a ticking clock. Barb Burkett. Yeah, I'm just. Um... I, I, at I, the... I was told that the two Armands had a really short clock left. It, why yeah. is it? Sorry. I'm sorry, go ahead. Why isn't Fox Park commenting on this? Are they just, they don't comment on Windows or because they have no preference either way? Like, what's the reason? Yeah, um, they, they 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 decided to no longer comment on residential pro residential projects. That was just kind of they're moving forward their their um their way of doing things. 
Yeah. It just, it makes me so uncomfortable to force someone to pay $34,000 or I understand the other company is a thousand a window, but when you start to get, I deal with labor and all this stuff all the time in real estate, when you start to add up all these other costs and people tore out windows wrong, that cost grows very quickly. And to put this burden on someone that was forced into retirement and has health issues, it just does not sit well with me. So that's just my piece. Although Tiffany, I would, I would argue, Commissioner, that those windows were installed without a permit. And had she applied for a permit, all of this could have been avoided. Uh, you're, you're right about that. Can I ask Ms. Galvin, why didn't you apply for a permit? The person that I had to install those windows uh, wasn't aware of the permit either, but I, I thought I was doing the right thing because in the area the next door to me, the exact same square windows are, are, are there too. So him telling me that he didn't, he was unaware of uh, a permit. I mean, I know I stay in the historic area, but I never had to face this type of issue. So therefore I wasn't aware of how debt that you had to go into as far as getting certain things done. Had I had known, I would have went the right way, but I did not know. Chairman, in light of the circumstances, I'm fine with withdrawing my motion uh, to um, uphold the director's denial. Or we can vote it down. This is, yeah, this is, it's so frustrating and so tough because it's, you see this all the time, these contractors in the city that don't know the rules or don't know who to call. And it's just, and then the homeowners putting their hands in, you know, it's, it's frustrating, so. So I, don't, I just I hate to put this financial board burden on her though. Just to circle back to the chairman's question, um, we would need uh, the board to hear within 55 days, make a decision after filing of the appeal. So I'd have to defer to the director because I don't have a file with the filing date. So We have we have that date, but it is I, I I'm looking it up right now, but I do know that this is the last date that we can do it. Okay. So the last. before the for any possible next meeting, the time was very tight. Ms. Galvin, would you be willing to waive the clock and would let 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 us give you a chance to submit documents showing financial hardship? Sure. I can actually have them to miss the best tomorrow. It, it would probably be several weeks before we met again. Would that be okay? That's fine. Barb, does that work? Well, it's if she's making this request. Um... You did? I know with Mr. Moak, there is some precedent for that. Um, there it is. I mean, I think Commissioner Hamilton has made a good point. At the same time, there is a, a full agenda behind us and there, there seems to be a very strong difference between a bid for three thousand and a bid for thirty-four thousand. That probably we could straighten out in the next couple of weeks. Thirty-four thousand, I feel financial hardship. Three thousand, I don't know if I do or not. <clears throat> Are you looking at getting them? No, no Ms. Galvin, I'm, I'm I'm waiting. I'm waiting for the lawyer to. To, well, to, understood. I also would point out that, you know, while her testimony is a documentary evidence, it is also evidence, you know, just uh -huh. that, that can be considered just as a document may. Ms. Galvin, can you wait several weeks? Sure. If, if she pushes several weeks, um, 
So I know you said the 3,000, but it's not really the 3,000, it's 3,000 plus additional costs. Can you try to bid out the additional costs over the 3,000 so we have a good picture of what that actual number is versus the 34? I know it's gonna take a little bit more work, but I think- Ms. Gallen? I'll, I can, I'll work with, um, with her to try and get her some, some help with doing the bids. Okay. Alderman Coder, are you willing to withdraw your motion? I believe he has, he the second that. has not. Right. Yeah, I, I withdraw my motion. Who made the second? If mm -hmm. Will you withdraw your second? I, I actually made the second, I think. Yes, you did. Yeah, so does it matter if I withdraw it if there's no motion to second? Yes, it does. It actually does matter. We, we can't withdraw the motion unless the, the maker and the seconder agree. Well, I think we're making special provisions here for this woman. I feel for her too, but you might note that Ray is still on the line, the guy who just got that that uh, opposite treatment in the same neighborhood. So I think we're heading for trouble with this. Okay. So, I don't, that's, that's why I put it no for the last one, because I had the same concern. There's no standards. Um, I don't know. Well, you can see if you vote no on all these things, I mean, anybody who walks in here can get whatever they want. I mean, we do have to uh, think about these rules sometimes. I'd like to vote yes for all these people all the time, too. But there's just we got to think about more than that. And so I, I understand that I think about more than that. But I'm also saying in past history, we have voted based on whatever we're thinking. So there's no there's no consistency. That's my point. So for us to say, oh, Ray was voted one way and Miss Galvin was voted one way in this, okay, Beth last month was voted one way and Jim was voted another way. So let's create consistency. So maybe we just table it to next to next time um, and actually and look at the situation. Because I don't think all situations are created equal. Um, Barb, Barb, we've talked about this in the past. We do have some standards in place for this, don't we? We're looking at hardship. No. We don't have a specific form, if that's what you're saying, like a statement of income and expense. Um, again, the you can consider any applicant or, or appellant's testimony and weigh the credibility of that and, and look at it in light of the situation. And that is evidence as well as documentary evidence. Um, I believe that um, Bob Bettis will testify that he's given applicants the um, understanding that they are able to submit documentary evidence. I believe he testified to that earlier. Okay, thank you. I'll withdraw my second. Okay. Is there a new motion? Do I hear a, do I hear a motion to table this until the next meeting? My motion is to table this until December meeting. Is there a second? Second. Motion made in was, second. Is there was any it Mr. Robinson? Yes. Is there any discussion? Hearing none. I'm going to call a roll. The motion on the floor is to table this until the next meeting. Commissioner Hamilton, do you vote yes or no? Yes. Commissioner Gilbert, do you vote yes or no? Yes. Commissioner Robinson, do you vote yes or no? Yes. Alderman Cody, do you vote yes or no? Yes. Commissioner Colleen, do you vote yes or no? No. Chair abstains on this vote. There's four yeses, one no, one abstention. The motion carries. This matter is tabled until our next meeting. Commissioners calling next agenda item E. Item, item, item sorry, item what? E. E. Sorry, thank you. All right. Good evening, everyone. I'm Meg Lusto with the Cultural Resources Office, and I swear to tell the truth. Um, this is the project at 1070, 1074, 1076, 1080, 1084, 1086-88, and 1092-94 South Kings Highway. 
I would like to enter into the record enabling ordinance 64689, preservation review district ordinance 64832 and 66609, the agenda, this PowerPoint and presentation. Um, this is a project to demolish seven buildings in the 1000 block of Kings Highway. You can see here the exact location and here's an aerial view giving you some context. These are the buildings in question. Many of you are probably familiar with them. This is a very high profile location. <coughs> Pardon me. The buildings are in a preservation review area in the Forest Park Southeast neighborhood. Um, 1070 South Kings Highway is a two-story commercial building constructed circa 1915. The front facade was modified historically, but retains subtle art deco and prairie style architectural references. The building is considered merit under ordinance 64689 as the building is a contributing resource to the Forest Park Southeast National Register District. 1074 South Kings Highway is a two-story, two-family residential building constructed in 1906. The front facade has been significantly altered and the building is a non-contributing resource to the Forest Park Southeast National Register District. 1076 South Kings Highway is a revival style two story, two family residential building constructed in 1906. This building and its neighbor to the south are unusual examples of turn of the century two family flats with separate entrances at opposite ends of the facade. In this case, a wide window is between the two hip drift porches. At the second story, there are two wide sash windows with a stone sill course. The steep pitched roof has been applied between the two side parapet walls, hiding the flat roof behind. The building is considered merit under ordinance 64689 as the building is a contributing resource to the Forest Park Southeast National Register District. 1080 South Kings Highway is a revival style, two-story, two-family residential building constructed in 1906. The building has lost its front, two front entry porches, but retains enough of its architectural integrity to be considered merit under ordinance 64689 as the building is a contributing resource to the Forest Park Southeast National Register District. 1084 South Kings Highway, constructed in 1922, is a craftsman-style two-story, four-family walk-up. The building retains a high degree of its architectural integrity and detailing. The side gabled roof still retains its original red clay tile roofing. The building is considered merit under Ordinance 64689, as the building is a contributing resource to the Forest Park Southeast National Register District. 1086, 88 South Kings Highway is a revival-style two-story, two-family residential building constructed in 1906. The first floor is graced by four Roman arches that surround the central doors and flanking windows. The mansard roof is still clad in its original gray slate. Although it has lost original doors and windows, the building retains enough of its architectural integrity to be considered merit under Ordinance 64689, as it is a contributing resource to the Forest Park Southeast National Register District. And lastly, 1092-94 South Kings Highway is a revival-style two-story, four-family, constructed in 1902 and is the oldest building in the row of seven proposed for demolition. The building has lost its original central entry porch, but retains enough of its architectural integrity to be considered merit under Ordinance 64689, as the building is a contributing resource to the Forest Park Southeast National Register District. <coughs> a little bit of background. In 2000s, oh, sorry, let me, let me show you the backs of the buildings as well. So here's the front looking north up Kings Highway. And then these are pictures of the rear taken from the alley. 1070, that's the more modern of the buildings. 1074. 1076, 1080, 1084, 1086, and 1092, 94. Let's see from the alley looking west. Um, in 2016, the Preservation Board upheld the Cultural Resource Office Director's denial of an application for demolition for the building at 1092-94 South Kings Highway. In their current conditions, all the buildings proposed for demolition are considered sound under Ordinance 64689. Um, <clears throat> the proposed new construction uh, is a seven-story apartment building composed mainly of brick and stucco panels. The inspiration for the building's overall design is drawn from warehouse and industrial building stock prevalent in the central corridor of the city. Large windows spaced throughout the building's facades feature grid patterns and light configurations referenced in that simple utilitarian design aesthetic. Exposed steel beams and accent panels between windows are intended to be reminiscent of formal historic storefronts and more ornate warehouses also appearing in St. Louis's historic built environment and would offer definition to the simple exterior of the building. The functional layout of the design is a U-shaped plan, but the building footprint has a rectangular shape form filling all seven parcels. There are <clears throat> there would be a central pool placed on a raised deck above the first story. And I'll give you an idea of that. So this is the site plan that was submitted to us. 
The next paragraph in our staff report, I'll read and then I will offer a, an amendment. Two garage entrances on the west facade, the Kings Highway facade, would front onto South Kings Highway and serve as the sole vehicular access and egress from the building. There would be no vehicular access on the rear of the building that faces the alley and the dense residential neighborhood to the east. Um, we received uh, a change to these plans late on Friday, uh, and we were unable to consider them in our report and in our analysis. Uh, but the applicant has apparently changed the layout so that the vehicular access is no longer from South Kings Highway, but is instead from the rear about here, if you if you can see my cursor. Um, and that would mean that all traffic, all cars coming and going would have to come up Oakland or Arco because there is no way to drive onto those streets from Kings Highway. So the traffic would now be going through the neighborhood. Uh, and the applicant will have an opportunity to address that when they present. So going through the relevant legislation, um, there is no redevelopment plan in place here, so that's not applicable. The architectural quality of the existing buildings, six of the buildings are considered merit structures. The ordinance considers a merit building as contributing to an existing or potential city or national historic district. While the building at 1074 North Kings Highway, sorry, South Kings Highway is not a contributing resource to the National Register District, it is part of an intact streetscape and holds the block in the cohesive manner seen throughout the neighborhood. It's important to the historic block face itself is as important as that of the adjacent merit structures. Uh, condition, no, uh, this is another amendment that I have to make um, because our report said that no structural report on the building's condition has been submitted by the property owner. Upon inspection by staff, it was found that the seven buildings are in a similar state to what they were in 2016 when 1092-94 was South Kings Highway was first considered for demolition. This intersection of the rear wall of that house has suffered a partial collapse. It does not appear to be endangering the structure as a whole. Although clearly evincing deferred maintenance, all seven buildings appear to be able to stand for six months or more. Therefore, the buildings are all considered sound under ordinance 64689. Um, I offer another amendment to this report, and that is that uh, literally moments before this meeting began, we received a batch of information from the developer team that did include a letter from a structural engineer. I have forwarded all that information to the preservation board members. I realized that it came very last minute and you may not have a chance, may not have had a chance to take a look at it. Indeed, we barely had a chance to take a look at it, but there is a letter that says that um, the existing structures are structurally unsound, unstable, and have a very strong potential to collapse and should be demolished immediately before causing any property or human damage. That letter is dated August 2nd of 2021 and further states that the letter is limited to observations made from visual evidence. No destructive or invasive testing was performed. Um, I'm sorry, what, what did you say the date on the letter was? August 2nd of 2021. And who was the engineer? That is, uh, let's see, it's Al Iman Group and Mohammed T. Al Harash is the person who signed and stamped this letter. And you got it today? That's correct. Okay, I'm sorry. Um, we also, and I, also in that packet that we were sent late today, were letters from the city citing the owners of the property for um, the, the condition of the property. So, all right, continuing on with our evaluation. Um, neighborhood effect and reuse potential. The site is located in an area with a strong real estate market. Um, <clears throat> reuse potential. No information has been submitted to counter the viability of the buildings for reuse. Six of the seven buildings are contri considered contributing resources to the Forest Park Southeast National Register District and are therefore eligible for historic preservation tax credits to assist in their rehabilitation. We have received no evidence of economic hardship. Um, we have earlier voiced concerns about the integrity of block face. Losing one or all of the buildings on this intact block would seriously compromise the historic continuity of the east side of South Kings Highway from Gibson to the north, down Wichita to the south. Um, proposed demolition of the buildings, the buildings are situated on a heavily trafficked thoroughfare and serve as a strong western edge for the Forest Park Southeast neighborhood and National Register District. Their demolition would negatively impact the appearance and integrity of that edge. Um, before I get to the proposed new construction, I just want to give you a little bit of context here. Again, I'm sure that most of you know this, this area very well. This is the context looking northwest across Kings Highway from the site. This is the view north. You can see the buildings on the right. This is looking at the buildings if you're heading south on Kings Highway. This is immediately to the north. Um, it's a lambskin temple. Um, this is the context on the opposite side of Kings Highway. 
This is <clears throat> Oakland Avenue, and that's the gate that would prevent any vehicular access from easily accessing the alley and forcing all traffic to come through uh, the neighborhood from the east side. So um, <clears throat> propose a new construction. And again, this is the information that had been submitted to us. That the, the applicant's going to present something slightly different, but again, that was not sent to us until Friday afternoon. <clears throat> so propose a new construction. Would it equal or concede equal or exceed the contribution of the, the existing structures to the integrity of the existing streetscape and block face? Partially complies. The proposal is to construct a seven-story apartment building with interior parking that would occupy the entire western block face along South Kings Highway. It would be the first building of the scale to be constructed in this part of the neighborhood in the stretch of Kings Highway. The first story, center bay of the primary facade, would feature a series of four glazed storefronts with offset main entry marked by a distinctive surround and protecting canopy. Vehicular access to the internal parking areas would be via driveways flanking the central entry storefronts. These two points would serve as the only ingress egress from the garage. And you can see in this rendering, again, the one that we used for our, evalu our evaluation, vehicular access here and here along South Kings Highway. That is no longer the case, apparently. <clears throat> the end bays on the first floor are striated brick panels without fenestration that helps conceal portions of the parking. The rest of the massing of the building has a distinctive vertical emphasis by utilizing shafts of dark red brick veneers interspersed between darker gray tone stucco panels. The, building lar the building's large scale would be somewhat moderated by projecting corner bays flanking one story section carrying a pool and roof garden. Elements have been derived from historic industrial precedents in a contemporary translation. While the fenestration is current in form, it repeats the vertical orientation of historic windows. Modern storefronts have historic tripartite divisions with glazed bulkheads and the towers terminate in cornices that are overscaled and streamlined. As to whether the proposed construction would be architecturally compatible, generally does not comply. 1,000 block of South Kings Highway and surrounding streets comprise a mix of small scale residential, commercial and institutional buildings. The seven story block long building would unavoidably dwarf the surrounding residential neighborhood to the east, comprised mostly of uh, two story residential structures with adjacent low rise institutional buildings to the north and south. The architectural articulation of the proposed new construction is also not compatible with its surrounding built environment. The design is inspired by industrial inspirations and the general makeup of the fenestration and vertical and horizontal elements do not fit this location in any cohesive manner. Oversized cornice references, storefronts, and large expanses of uninterrupted brick do not fit the streetscape. Okay, I apologize for that. Uh, we removed that as quickly as we could. Good work. <laughs> um, the proposed uh, use complies with current zoning requirements. The proposal has not yet been formally reviewed for compliance with the Forest Park Southeast form based code. However, staff notes, again, based on the original submission, that the code does require that parking and services be accessed via an alley when one is present. So the vehicular access from South Kings Highway would likely require variants from the form-based code. Um, lastly, the, the proposed new construction would commence within 12 months from the application date, and we, we don't have the construction date provided by the applicant. So um, just to go through the other drawings that were submitted, this is the Northwest elevation. This is a detail, again, showing the vehicular access uh, and the uh, storefronts. Northeast elevation, west elevation outlining materials, and some refined drawings showing streetscapes. Again, along Kings Highway looking east, you can see this would be the lambs Lambskin Temple here. Uh, from Oakland looking north, Arca looking south. And then there's some information about specific materials. This again is a site plan that was submitted showing no access from the rear and vehicular access only from South Kings Highway. So 
preliminary findings and conclusions, <clears throat> the cultural resources office consideration of the criteria for demolition, the preservation review district ordinance led to these preliminary findings. 1070, 1074, 1076, 1080, 1084, 1086, 88, and 1092, 94 South Kings Highway Boulevard are located in the Forest Park Southeast National Register District and the Preservation Review District. Six of the seven buildings are considered merit under Ordinance 64689 as they are contributing resources to the Forest Park Southeast National Register District. The buildings are sound within the definition of the ordinance, which means that visible portions of exterior walls and roofs appear capable of continuing to support their current loads for six months or more. Loss of the buildings would negatively impact the appearance and integrity of the western edge of this neighborhood and historic district. The proposed new construction would be incompatible in mass, scale, and style with the existing historic fabric. It would impart a different character to the neighborhood with the introduction of a tall, massive structure into a small scale walkable neighborhood. Um, I'd also like to note that we, in your packet board members, you got letters of opposition from Peter Thatcher, I think, Michael Browning, and the Forest Park Southeast Neighborhood Association. Meg, is that the end of your presentation? That concludes my presentation. Thank you. Okay. Commissioners, questions for staff? Okay, let's hear from the appellant. Hi, Commissioner Cal, can you hear me? I okay. can. Okay, great. Uh, my name is Sid Trucker. You're, break, you're breaking up just a little bit. Uh, um, luck living. And uh, maybe I could just any better now or? Not really. You're either in tent or frozen. I can't tell which. I think he might be intently frozen. <laughs> I can pick up if you'd like, Mr. Chair. Okay, who's speaking? Uh, David Sweeney, counsel for the applicant. Is your testimony gonna be the truth? It is. Proceed. I think it'd be best uh, to for Mike Burkhart to uh, take over, he's the architect on the project to kind of walk through um, the, the new design and um, director Uso, Uso was correct in that the packet did come late on Friday and apologize for that. And um, additional information was sent um, late, earlier today. So I thank you for accepting that. Um, but I'll, I'll defer to the architect to kind of go through that. If that's all right with you, Sid, if you're back on. Are you, are you able to hear me now, Commissioner? Yes. Yeah. Okay, sorry about that. I uh, just tried to restart the Wi-Fi here. So I can just give you a little bit of background and then I can turn it over to the architect. Um, we started working on these projects uh, late 2000, early 2001. Uh, we shared, there's been, you know, many different iterations of what we've proposed to develop and at the site. And you know, there's, it's really important to keep in mind that the, the form-based code really dictates what should be built here. So, um, you know, we're using and we're complying with the form-based code, trying to achieve a, a lot of different. You guys able to hear me? Okay, so we started with one set of kind of renderings for the building. And we've, we kind of came up with a different strategy. I don't know if Mike, maybe you could present um, and share kind of the current strategy. The current strategy takes into account um, over a year's worth of meeting with the neighborhood. We met with the neighborhood three times, uh, meeting with a few people in, in Meg's office uh, to review brick colors, exterior uh, elevations, um, just overall glazing patterns. And we came up with uh, a strategy that we think achieves both the form-based code, but also achieves um, lots of neighborhood feedback. So the building setback 
um, on its rear, rear elevation. We took the pool that was originally put for the rear, rear of the property and moved it to the front of the property. Uh, one of the big uh, necessities with the Ford base code is how ingress and egress takes place. So the current ingress and egress for the property is through the rear um, as we presented it. And that ensures that we don't have to ask for any variances uh, for the site. We are always willing to work with the neighborhood in any capacity if, if a variance is instructed by this board. Um, but we wanted to provide a solution that complies with the form base code um, and does not request any variances for the property. Uh, I also wanted to note, so like, this process of filing for demolition actually started back in early September um, of last year, so in 2021. And when we filed for demolition, we originally filed with the structural engineer's report. So in the package that I shared with you, um, this isn't the first time we've shared the structural engineer's report or the violations from the city. Uh, many of those are, 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 have been going on for over a year and I shared when we originally made that presentation, um, which hopefully, we made it to Meg's office, uh, we, we file that through a demolition contractor for um, demo of these buildings. And so maybe what, what I could do is maybe share it and turn it over to Mike, uh, mm -hmm. who's the architect on the project, and he can kind of maybe go through some of the specific details we worked through over the past year with the neighborhood. So before you do, I don't know whether it was the, the audio quality or I, I misheard. Did you say you started working on this project in 2001? Yeah, early 2001, maybe like late 2000. So 20 years ago? No, 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 20, I'm sorry, <laughs> not 20, 20 years ago, 2020, 2021. Okay. Like okay. a year ago. Do you swear to tell the truth? Yes, sir. Proceed. All right. Um, this is Mike Burkhart, president of the E Design Group, and um, and I do swear to tell the truth. So, um, so Meg, are you driving on the presentation? Or yes. Okay. All right. So let's just leave it right there for just a second. I want to give you a little bit of background on mm -hmm. you know what's kind of been our design approach, you know, on the project. We uh, we did do our first presentation like April of last year, twenty twenty one. And you know, our, our first presentation was really a more modern design. It did not look like this at all. It was um, it had a brick base <clears throat> and you know metal siding is a much more modern look. And we we met with um, we met with cultural resources at the time, you know, and and met with the neighborhood and um, and to be honest, we didn't get great feedback. You know that day that wasn't the the style of building that was, um, you know, desired, you know, for this this area. So some recommendations were made by the neighborhood. Um, you know, one of them being more of a brick facade, something more historic looking, something that matches, you know, the materials that, um, you know, that are present in the neighborhood. So we we took that into account. Another another item is we did have the pool on the backside of the building, and. Um, it was actually on the northeast corner of, of the building versus the King's Highway side. And there was concerns about just noise and just privacy and having the pullback elevated in that area. Um, and the other concern was that we, we did have on our first presentation um, a, a concept that did not require any variances. So, so we had the garage door coming in from the um, from the alley and that was another concern of the neighborhood that um, you know that we modified we actually met with um, you know the traffic um, commissioner we we, you know, we got we got a traffic consultant on in place to see if it would be viable to um, to come in from king's highway and did a traffic study um, you know to understand that so we so we went back, I think it was August of last year. <clears throat> and, you know, with a, with a, or August of this year with a new plan. And um, not that the base is important, but it, I think it was July. When, when was it, Meg, on, the, on that last presentation? Sorry, I don't have that information at my fingertips, Mike. I'm sorry. 
I've got it right here. So it was in June. June 21st is when we met with the neighborhood again. So, so Meg, the, um, the presentation that you were evaluating was what we showed the neighborhood, you know, which had the entrances from the front. And, and we moved the pool and we, we changed most of the facade to brick, um, you know, and some stucco, got rid of the metal panel. Um, we also, um, you know, got, like I said, got the drive entrance on the front. So we, after meeting with the neighborhood, we, we, were, we were denied um, support, you know, from the neighborhood with that concept. And, you know, so now we are, um, you know, also being denied, you know, for demolition from cultural resources. So, so we're kind of in a position of not really being able to get a building built through this avenue you know, with, um, you know, with, with a building that requires variances. So our, our approach and why, and why we resubmitted on Friday was we, we were reworking the building to, in, a, in, in a way that still kept the brick facade and still kept the pool in the front, um, but we also stepped the building back above the third story on the rear so that would not also not need a variance and also put the, the entrance to the garage, you know, back, you know, um, in, in the alley so that, again, our, our, <clears throat> our um, approach is to design a building that complies with the form-based code and does not require any variances. So that's why the change. And, and it's just for us to get this building built you know, we, we, we really would prefer to, to build exactly what we submitted back in June, um, but without support, we, we can't really, you know, move forward with that. So, so this is a path for us to be able to, you know, to take a building that doesn't need any variances to the planning commission, you know, if, if that's our, our next step that we have to take. So we were definitely would love to have, you know, an approval or conditional approval of this, and, um, you know, and start working through any variances and just try to get that, you know, in place. But, so that's, that's why we're presenting this building. So if you go to the next slide. So you can see that our unit count because of the changes we had to make um, has been modified to about 11 less units. I think we're down to 144. Um, we, we also will have 144 spaces in the garage and park it one to one you know, per, per the ordinance. Um, let's just go ahead and go to the next slide. And you've already kind of showed where the, where the project is. And you've also, in the next slide, um, you know, the existing structures, you've covered that well. So let's keep going. And let's go ahead and go one more. All right. So this is the this is the front elevation, um, you know. So it'd be facing Kings Highway. So our, you know, part of our design approach from the very beginning again was to design a building that, you know, that was consistent with the form based code, con considering that from the, the city's master plan, you know, being the neighborhood core through here, uh, that this this would follow what the what the plan has been all along. So that was that was part of our decision to do this. It was also our assumption that these buildings are not rebuildable and that they've really been sitting there for decades, you know, without, without this area of the street activated. And, um, you know, and, and also there's just not, it just doesn't create positive activity there at this point. So our goal is to create a building that, that that's activates the street, um, you know, has a, has a bistro in it that's, a, you know, open to the, to the public. And, and, and to really start creating positive activity at this location that, that hasn't had it for decades. So that, that's, we, we feel like it would be a, you know, a great um, improvement you know, for, the, for the neighborhood as a whole. That's, that's what, we, what's, what we believe. So we also, um, as I said, it's consistent with the form-based code. Um, we also realized the, the you know, the, the project will immediately start generating a large tax base because um, we're not going to ask for any incentives. You know, so, we're, you know, we're getting estimated, you know, $5 million of tax base over, you know, 10 years. Um, you know, so that's, 
you know, that, that's been kind of our goals for our design. And, you know, we, we've been back and forth with culture resource office. I don't know what, how many times, three or four times at least, you know, and trying to come up with different iterations and providing details that, you know, and, and precedent for, you know, how these details have been used in other historic areas of St. Louis. And, you know, and just, just think this will be a good start for, you know, building this, this uh, neighborhood core area. Let's go ahead and go to the next slide. So this is a picture from the, from the Northwest. And you can see in this picture, you know, what we have done is we've modified the building in that back corner so that it's stepping back 30 feet from the, from the alley. Again, so that it would provide some relief um, as far as the mass of the building at the rear. And, um, and again, not, not requiring variances for, you know, for any setbacks. Next one. So this is rear, rear elevation and um, we're still schematic design. We'll be doing some things to improve this some um, when it's all, it's all finished, but, but it, the main thing is it's all brick um, and, it, and it does step back after the third story to um, you know, provide that, that setback to provide relief in that area. And you can see here, this is where the garage door, um, which, which would be coming in from the alley. And we probably would prefer that wasn't the case, but, you know, but we, um, um, we, we would need to, to get approval, you know, to, you know, if it's conditional approval to, you know, put it in the front, you know, that would definitely be a consideration. And the next slide, which is the um, south, uh, actually that's the, um, the north elevation. Pretty much the same thing as perspective. Next one, south, where you can see the setback. And as far as the type of product that we, you know, that we're designing, you know, for this location, you know, the next slide, just wanted to throw in, you know, some of the other, projects that we've built that, you know, would definitely be a, a high-end finish that we think is, would provide a great, you know, option for, you know, living in this area, especially with the hospital being so close, um, you know, being Missouri's largest employer. So um, we, we think it's housing that's needed and, you know, we plan to provide a, a very upscale, a very nice product, you know, for the area. And the next slide. Um, we, we do like amenities and um, it, sets, it kind of sets some of our projects apart from others. And, you know, we, we haven't committed fully to what the amenities will be at this location, but, but this is an example of amenities and other projects in, in St. Louis that we've, that we've built. And a basketball court is likely, you definitely will have a nice gym, a very upscale gym, um, a nice lobby, bistro, um, you know, likely a spa, and all this would be on that on that ground floor level. And the next one. All right, so this this is the modified site plan um, from what was shown earlier. That was modified to you know for the rear entry. You know, so so this again is our approach of having something that doesn't you know that doesn't require any variances. But would, but would definitely accept an approval for, you know, something coming in the front. And then, um, I think that's probably about it. That's all that we have from you, Mike. Yep, okay. So, um, so I guess we'll just take any questions or um, I'm not sure, Sweeney, if you want to, same thing at this point. Uh, I just have a, a housekeeping uh, question for the uh, director. I just want to make sure we have into the record information that was provided um, late today, Meg, if, if that's in the record. Just want to make note Received of that. Received it very late today, and I did as quickly as possible send it to the preservation board. Good. That that's. I'm just confirming that. And thank you again. I appreciate it. I apologize. <clears throat> 
Sid, did you have anything you wanted to add? No, I just thought I would just mention that, you know, there's there's a lot of different inputs and a lot of different feedback that came um, to this fighter, final iteration. Um, but what we were really hoping to achieve was uh, a mix of um, cultural significance that we received from cultural resources, neighborhood feedback of things that were important to the neighborhood, and then obviously following the form-based code um, so we can build a building uh, that, that is zoned and entitled correctly. Commissioners, questions for the appellant? Uh, I have a few, uh, Commissioner Colleen here. So um, when you say uh, we, are, are you the architect? Do you work for the developer? Do you have your own practice? Who's we? Well, <clears throat> um, VE Design Group, I'm the president of VE Design Group. And we're an architectural structural MEP company for uh, Springfield, Missouri. And, um, and we do multifamily projects all over the United States. Oh, I see. And you've done other projects for this client? We have, yes. Okay, just wanted to clarify. And when you talked about neighborhood engagement, um, so uh, did, did the neighborhood get a chance to look at this uh, information submitted today? No, they they looked at the one that um, was um, submitted in June, and and it was it was denied. So so this this one here is um, very similar, um, except. We, we just we just change it so that it wouldn't require any variances. Mr. Colleen, I could I could explain maybe the distinction. So there was an original iteration that was presented to the neighborhood in April of 2021. Um, from that original iteration, there was feedback that kind of changed the entire landscape of the building that we represented, I want to say in August, and then again maybe a couple months later to the neighborhood. Um, we took all of the neighborhood's feedback and cultural feedback. So they, they've seen a version of this building, but one that would have still required variances against the form-based code. So we've taken this, the building that they that, that had the most support um, from the neighborhood and cultural resources and um, modified specifically that rear entrance because that is a requirement under the form-based code. Okay, uh, but that hasn't made the rounds over there. They haven't seen it. We're all seeing this for the first time today. Is that right? This this final iteration, yes, but I think uh, one that's very similar to this that that did require variances had been seen previously. And just, I'm sorry to, to have so many questions, but could you list the changes uh, that that are in today's um, iteration, just briefly? <clears throat> the the only change would be that the um, the rear of the building above the third level is now stepped back another 25 feet. So that, it, so that it maintains the um, the form-based code requirement so that we don't have to ask for a variance for that item. And the other would just be the um, the location of the in, of the entrance, the garage entrance, and then okay. just a reduction of units, which really doesn't, you know, isn't a big deal, but it, it would be a reduction of other units. Okay, thank you. And a question for staff, who is who makes the call if, if we've met form-based code or not? Is that staff or someone else at the neighborhood or? It goes through the uh, the zoning department. We play a small role, but um, the zoning department is the one that issues the formal opinion on that. So obviously they haven't had a chance to react to this yet, right? I don't believe they've even submitted. Okay, thank you. Further questions by commissioners of the appellant? Okay. Meg? Do we have commenters? We do. Okay. Um, first, we have Alderwoman Tina Sweet T. Peel. Alderwoman Peel, are you still here? Okay. Um, I'm sure if she will join if she can. Um, next on the list is Michael Browning. Hello. Hello. Tell us your name and tell us that your testimony will be the truth. My name is Michael Browning and uh, I promise to tell the truth. Proceed. Okay, thank you. Um, good evening and thank you for the opportunity to speak with the board today. Uh, as I said, my name is Michael Browning. I'm speaking for myself today and I'm a decade long actively involved member of the Forest Park Southeast neighborhood. Um, I understand that the Preservation Board's job today is to consider the buildings on Kings Highway and whether the demolition is appropriate. 
but what this board should consider is that demolition is the beginning of a process that will last more than a year, a process that has many red flags and questions surrounding it. Uh, and worse than the questions are the things that we already know about Lux Living. Uh, they're not being honest with you today. Uh, the people, the only people who would welcome Lux Living into their neighborhood are people who don't know who they are or someone who somehow values poorly built buildings over the people in their own neighborhood. Uh, we know that this developer has a track record of shoddy construction. We know we don't know if their buildings are up to code because, frankly, the city doesn't have the inspectors to stay on top of it. Uh, today, we're finding out that Lux Living is switching out the plan without notice because they think this they, they can push this through uh, if they claim that it doesn't need any variances from our form-based code. And I'll get to that in a minute. Uh, we also know that they have a long record of buildings with violations. Multiple articles in the Post-Dispatch, KMOX, and the Riverfront Times have detailed violations of the fire code, issues with mold, lead paint, electrical problems. Earlier this year, a video showed their newest building, the Hudson, taking on water like the Titanic in the parking garage and in the elevator bank. Buildings like the Raphael are of active interest to the EPA. There was an article recently uh, on Thursday about the fire system and the EY Walker uh, that they still haven't fixed after months. We know because there was a fire and the alarms didn't go off. Uh, so we know that their word is essentially meaningless. They've been caught in so many lies, including the owners being sanctioned by the SEC in the past, but now they lie about almost everything from their occupancy rates to their fake online reviews. I spoke with neighbors who had had their property damaged by the owners. Uh, this company also moved tenants into their building before the uh, occupancy permits were issued. They make people sign NDAs in order to exit their lease early. We can't trust what they say. And because of all these things, the Forest Park Southeast Neighborhood Association opposed this development. These buildings, which are now on their second set of owners who are attempting to, dem to demolish them through neglect, uh, they shouldn't be torn down and replaced by something worse. Our neighborhood opposes the demolition because of what comes after, the long chain of events that'll get kicked off if demolition is approved. Now, I know that the city has its processes, and some of them, well, I should say none of them, are really equipped to deal with a developer who can't be trusted. But your sticking point should be this. We don't know if this actually meets our form-based code in the neighborhood. They say it does, but we can't trust them. I'm aware of our code and their building is not meeting the setback requirements. That rear step back, and again, I'm judging this because it's the first time I've seen this today, but that rear step back is four stories that requires a 30 foot step back. They need variances to complete this project. And even this last minute bait and switch isn't gonna change that. The neighborhood doesn't trust them enough to support the variances, not after everything we've heard and seen, including from their own employees. And from those employees, we also know that they discuss sabotaging the buildings to make them fall down faster. So don't fall for the production they're putting on here. There is ample evidence of who and what this company is. We have examples in our neighborhood where poor vetting and quick decisions have left us with empty lots at 4101 Manchester and the site of the Arbor on Arco. We don't need that again. So is the city gonna get burned by the developer again? <laughs> take the risk of letting the developer with this kind of track record who hasn't even fixed their current properties build here against the wishes of the neighborhood. And do we even know if they have the ability, the ability to complete it or if it'll just be left as a hole in the ground? And is the city okay with using our neighborhood as an experiment to find the answers to all of these questions? And for what it's worth, the Neighborhood Association's engagement process was uh, referenced a couple times. Our project, our, uh, engagement process on this project was extensive. We held three meetings over a 10 month period and provided both in person and online options for attending. We put flyers on every door within two blocks of the, de of the development, totaling 12 square blocks, distributed flyers on lampposts throughout the rest of the neighborhood. All of our meetings were recorded and can be found on our website. The letter that was submitted by the association is a summary of what occurred and we covered both supporters of the project and people who were opposed. The majority opposed it, and the facts here are pretty damning. We ask that you deny the demolition and require the developer to stabilize the structures that they have owned for the last two years. 
they're using them as a bargaining chip, you know, more of a hostage situation to try to force through a building that the neighborhood doesn't want because we have seen what their buildings are like in other neighborhoods and how their owners have treated tenants in the greater community. So requiring that they take immediate steps to stabilize the buildings will solve any current safety threat posed by the condition, but denying the demo will also solve the future safety threat posed by this developer. What they do here will be worse than what we currently have. Thank you for your time tonight. Meg, who's next? Next, uh, Mike Burkhardt, but I believe he's already spoken. Uh, Dmitry Nedvetsky. Yeah, hi everyone. So uh, in general, I was just giving the feedback. As far as I understand, I'm living the, in this community and uh, I had no uh, issues with the amenities. They are- Be Before you begin, <laughs> would you say your name? And uh, you yeah, of course, sorry. My what name is, happen? yeah, of course, sorry. My name is, uh, Dmitry Nidvetsky, and I am uh, a tenant of the community in Taos Kingsway, uh, an engineer's building. It's hey, called is, Soho. is your testimony going to be the truth? Yeah. Okay. Proceed. Proceed. The experience. Yes, sir. So, uh, so far, I've been living in the community for uh, approximately two months, uh, just give or take, two or three. I had no issues uh, with the uh, building itself uh, and with my apartment specifically, uh, and uh, neither had any issues with the uh, amenities. Uh, they are working. I am constantly using them, uh, specifically the gym, for example. And I'm having, uh, so far, no negative feedback regarding the uh, building. It's still work in progress, but uh, the building itself is great. And everything related to it, that's it. If you have any questions to clarify, feel free. I'll try to give as much as I can. Thank you. Meg, who's next? Next is David Sweeney. But he's a member of the- I've already spoken, thank okay. you. Uh, the next is Tyler Calhoun. Yes, hello. Can everybody hear me? Yes. T tell us your name and tell us you're going to tell us the truth. My name is Tyler Calhoun and I will be telling the truth today. Proceed. Yes. So um, somebody a few uh, moments ago spoke about Eli Walker and the fire that happened. I'm currently a resident of Eli Walker Lofts. I don't rent from Citywide or Lux Living, but I am a tenant of a building that they control since they have over 50% of the building, over 50% of the units in Eli Walker are owned by Citywide. So they therefore have control over our condo association board, which means they control the building. Um, I can attest to the fire that happened on Thursday and that alarms or fire systems did not go off. We've known about the faulty or non-working fire systems for months now, nothing has changed. I can't stress enough how dangerous that was for the safety, obviously, of the tenants here. I was at work, people had, people were at work, people had pets in their apartments. Had it not been for one resident who noticed the smoke, that fire could have potentially spread. And we wouldn't have even known about it because no alarms, no fire systems would have sounded or there wouldn't have been any sprinkler systems put the fire out. Our building is currently, it's pretty much, it's pretty dilapidated. It's maintenance is not being kept up. Our elevators are constantly going out. When we complain about these issues, they rarely get fixed. Or if they do get fixed, it's not a good job. The management of the building is extremely poor. They're very hard to reach. And at the time, if you do reach them, they have an attitude. So Lux Living tends to let their buildings waste away. It might start off good, but they don't generally follow through. And basically just become a cash cow for them at the expense of residents who unfortunately rent from them. 
So I just wanted to say that the denial should stand and that's all I have to say. Thank you, Meg, who's next? Sue Kreusel. Ms. Kreusel, are you still in the room? Okay, uh, next on the list is Devin Clark. Good evening. Hello, tell us your name, please. Yes, my name is Devin Clark. Mr. Clark, will you read a testimony be the truth? Yes. Proceed. All right, good evening. Um, my name is Devin Clark. Uh, I'm a homeowner in the Forest Park Southeast neighborhood. Uh, I'm just commenting to support my, to voice my support for the demolition of the seven buildings on Kings Highway. As a member of the community, I have had the opportunity to see the current buildings in question and can attest that they are quite an eyesore. Uh, the proposed new building on the other hand is modern and attractive and it will greatly improve the, the aesthetics of the area. In addition to its visual appeal, the new building will provide much needed housing uh, for members of our community. With the housing market as tight as it is, any additional housing options are welcome. I believe that the construction of this new building is a positive step forward for our community and I support it wholeheartedly. Uh, <clears throat> at the moment, no one is being housed by those buildings on Kings Highway and for that reason and the reasons listed before, uh, I do support this motion. Thank you. Thank you. Meg, who's next? Next is Oasis Shake, and I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. Uh, hello, good evening. Uh, can you hear me okay? I can. Tell us your name, please. Hi, uh, my name is Oasis Shake, uh, and I'm here to tell the truth uh, regarding my experience living at uh, one of the buildings of Lux Living, uh, the Hudson Building. Proceed. Um, so I've been a resident now for just over a year. Um, I would like to say that my experience at the Hudson Building has been uh, very positive. Uh, the amenities uh, that they provide, um, as well as the actual location of the building uh, fits my needs uh, in terms of commuting and shopping and things. But the one thing that I would like to comment on uh, was when Mike was giving uh, the presentation and he talked about uh, how having this kind of building could increase uh, just like attraction and uh, businesses. It's been really cool uh, over the past year seeing uh, some of the new businesses being built uh, right on the corner of Skinker de Bolivar and Pershing, um, such as uh, a new taco shop, as well as a new grocery store opening right across the street. So uh, I would say that, you know, nothing's guaranteed, but based on my time here and seeing the dearth of businesses, uh, from the time when I first moved in to now, um, I've definitely seen a positive impact that um, a building like this uh, where professionals can move in can have the impact that can have on a community. So I uh, just wanted to give my two cents and uh, really appreciate uh, the time. Thank you. Thank you, Meg. Uh, I'm sorry. Next is Cami Lewis. Hello. I am Cami Lewis. I'm a, a member of Forest Park Southeast. I swear to tell the truth. In my testimony. Um, I live in the, or I'm a homeowner on the 4500 block of Gibson, which is just a block north. Uh, I attended all of the Lux Living meetings that the Neighborhood Association hosted. And the one, um, concession that, or the feedback that they seemed to receive by the third meeting was access from King's Highway. The neighborhood really didn't want uh, traffic to come through the alley and through the neighborhood because with all of the large apartment buildings that have been built, there has been a lot of traffic in the neighborhood and the our streets are just not prepared for it. Um, so it is concerning that they are now switching it back just because they think that they won't need a variance, but with a huge change like this, you would need, you're going to need variances. So I, it's upsetting that they would switch it from Kings Highway, but also I, like I was also never in favor of this project. I think a seven story building is completely out of place next to two story houses. 
especially, you know, even with a step back that is four stories right next to a two story building and that it's going to block so much sunlight for all of those houses. And it's, you know, it totally changes those backyards. I know they are an eyesore and unsightly, but they have lasted over a hundred years. I think something that is going to be whatever replaces them needs to last just as long and add just as like the same amount of presence to the block. Um, I guess that's it. Thank you, Meg. Next is Josiah Walton. Yep, thank you. So my name is Josiah Walton. I am a homeowner in the Wichita Avenue area of the Grove and I swear to tell the truth and nothing but the truth. Proceed. And by the way, that will, will hold you to that pledge until midnight. Okay. <laughs> um, so yeah, I've been here about two and a half years. Uh, I have attended the Neighborhood Association meetings as well. Um, I saw the developer make what looked like good faith concessions on the proposed initial design. Obviously, it's been a longstanding battle. Um, we know the area could use improvements and were initially amenable to the idea of having the place there. I know it's been a very fraught battle, but as a data-driven individual, I've never seen and now particularly want to see and understand the traffic impact that this thing is going to make. I heard pretty vehemently at many of the meetings, the opposition to having all of this traffic diverted already now down a very crowded streets, which we ourselves use daily. Um, and I'm a little bit shocked and feeling like I've been taken for a fool a little bit. I thought that many of the rumors or will you um, reputation, if you will, that has been presented about certain individuals maybe have been in hyperbole, but now there's a new piece of evidence and data here to support that. And I'm unfortunately really dis, you know, disappointed and maybe initially had been for the idea for development, but with this last minute sudden change, no longer am. And that's all I have to say, thank you. Thank you, Meg. Uh, next is Kevin Deptula. Hi, thank you. My name's Kevin Deptula. I am the president of Builders Block Contracting. Um, I'll tell the truth like everybody else. Uh, we've been we've been working for Sid and his group for about three years from now. We are one of the largest union and uh, residential contractors in the state of Missouri, employing about 500 people every day on job sites through our community. I'm in favor of these of projects like this because it employs a lot of people. Um, and we usually search for 30, 40 percent of our workforce from the surrounding neighborhoods of the projects to give young people an opportunity to um, learn a skill in the trades, which is uh, very much needed in our society these days, as well as the fact that we are well underbuilt in the United States of America. We've built 20 million less houses in the last 10 years. Uh, through 2010 through 2019 than we did from 2000 to 2009. And inventory levels in our community are 50% below what they were back in 2019 for housing, for our community, for our workforce, for our teachers, for our firefighters. Um, so for that reason, we need to build, we need to build houses in St. Louis and we need to find places to build them. And I would be in favor of this project. And again, we are a union contractor. Uh, we've built SID's uh, last three buildings as the carpentry contractor. So I know some comments were made about quality. Well, I can tell you from our trade, uh, those, those buildings are not gonna fall down. They're built with quality union tradesmen and they go through all the inspection processes and everything like that. So um, we would be in favor of this project. Thank you, Meg. Uh, next is Philip Heaney. That's Philip Hegney and Barb Prosser. Um, we're homeowners in the 4500 block of Gibson. Just and we agree name. to, I'm sorry, Barb Prosser. Phil Hegney. And we agree to tell the truth um, during this testimony. So 
Um, we are homeowners uh, in the 4,500 block of Gibson. We have lived in this neighborhood. Um, Phil has lived in this neighborhood over 50 years. I've lived in this neighborhood 35 years. So we uh, are long time homeowners. Um, we have strong concerns regarding what we're seeing today, which is not what we saw a couple months ago regarding the parking, the one-on-one -on -one parking, the traffic flow. Um, and it just feeds into our concern that Lux Living does not appear to be truthful or forthright with the neighborhood. I mean, I appreciate that in the beginning they heard some concerns and made adjustments, but I am concerned that this feels like a little bit of an ambush. Um, and so I fear for what lies ahead. I agree with Josiah Walton and Cami Lewis regarding the traffic flow. And uh, we already have restricted parking on our streets and I'm not sure where guest parking or anyone that has two cars in a household is gonna park. Um, and I don't feel uh, uh, that apartment numbers in the neighborhood are necessarily underbuilt anymore in this neighborhood. I think we have um, a lot of apartments at new apartment um, building and new apartment occupancy to be had in this neighborhood. So I'm not feeling the same sense of urgency and uh, need to have to uh, save the neighborhood in that, in that manner. And I, I will add uh, that there are three new apartment buildings built over the last uh, four to five years on uh, Kings Highway, I'm sorry, on Manchester between Kings Highway and Vanavenner. There are four buildings under construction immediately south of Manchester uh, along Taylor Avenue and Newstead Avenue. Um, and so those uh, are a fairly large number of apartments that um, are going to be coming online. In addition to that, Lux Living's reputation is important. And that reputation has been severely damaged, not just by one building that they've built or renovated, such as the uh, building downtown, but the Eli Walker building, but through a series of projects that they've done where major issues have been raised about the quality of the construction and about the quality of the management once the building has been open. Those are not the kinds of questions that come up with other developers whose reputation is solid. We need to be very careful about dealing with a company like, like Lux Living that has developed at best a very mixed reputation about how they do their work. Um, I is, does that conclude your remarks? Apparently, yes. Okay. <laughs> okay, great. Uh, next is Elena Shepard. Ms. Shepard, I think you're maybe muted. Hi, yes, thanks. Sorry, it took me a minute. So I want to echo what uh, everybody has said so far from the neighborhood. Um, uh, except the one person who uh, agrees with the uh, development. I think there was one. Uh, I live on the 4,500 block of Gibson. I do promise to tell the truth. Um, I've uh, been in this neighborhood since 2000. Um, and I was at, so I wasn't, I didn't, I wasn't able to make it to all the community meetings. Um, I am a nurse, um, but I've gone to several and what is clear to me that's happening is what they presented to us would require variances. Now they, the, it was very clear in the meetings that the neighborhood did not um, support the building of their property. It does not match the neighborhood. Uh, it is not gonna be at a price point that any teachers or firefighters are gonna be able to live. These are gonna be small apartments. Um, I'm not exactly sure who they will appeal to, uh, but it's not gonna be uh, they're not going to be anywhere affordable, not going to be the kind of housing uh, that people need. There is plenty of that in the neighborhood, as Phil Hegde pointed out. Um, so 
you know, just to, you know, there, there's no, uh, you know, this isn't mixed income or anything like that. Um, besides, it doesn't go with the character. Uh, but what's clear is that they, they knew that the neighborhood didn't want the building, so they don't want to have any variance, variances. So their strategy it seems clear to me. Their strategy was to um, make uh, the changes that we requested uh, with regard to the to the look and to the ingress and egress um, to a point that possibly would be palatable for us, but then when it comes time to presenting, have, have done a bait and switch to something that doesn't require variances because they know they wouldn't get the, the, the variances from us because we don't want the property. And I mean, if you had been in these meetings, um, it was quite, um, you can see that there are lots and lots of res residents who are um, uh, very passionate about it. And this is during the height of COVID. I mean, people coming in masks, you know, elderly people possibly risking their lives to make their comments. I live on the 4500 block of Gibson. And one thing to understand about the traffic pattern is to access my street, the only way that you can get to Arco is one way, okay? And Oakland is a dead end street. So um, Oakland, if you're gonna have 133 people living there and how many times they, you know, come and go, right? You're going to have, I mean, that's going to be essentially uh, like getting in and out of the parking lot of the promenade at, you know, in Brentwood. Um, either people going up and down our, uh, Oakland. Um, and th these are, we have lots of young kids. There are lots of families here. Um, and uh, there, are, you know, are, are children around riding bikes, that kind of thing. So you're going to have cars that, like a one uh, a street, either they can come up Oakland, which is a dead end street, so people going up and down, or they can come up Arco, which is a one way street, headed westbound. And then in order to get out, they're, they're gonna all go down Gibson, uh, which again is a residential street. It's a one way street. There are lots of families with young children uh, and it's completely out of the question. I, I mean, it's just, I am not a traffic engineer. Um, but you don't have to be a traffic engineer to uh, identify that the um, that the traffic will be completely unsustainable and unsafe, um, and people are going to be flying down the street. You know, I mean, it's going to make our street like King's Highway, right? But you know, Oakland, Arco, and Gibson, um, which is a huge problem. So just that issue, in and out. If there was no other issues going on that in and of itself should prevent you know any kind of agreement that these buildings can be demolished to build what they've suggested i appreciate your time thank you very much thank you meg uh yes next and last is alderwoman tina sweet tea peel uh thank you culture resources office and the preservation commission as all the women of the 17th Ward in the city of St. Louis um, adamantly opposed to the developers getting away with using deceptive practices uh, in this city. You know, contrary to the site design presented to the Forest Park Southeast community, the Cultural Resources Office, uh, myself and the Neighborhood Association and the community as a whole, you know, Lux Living presented as we have seen these new designs just hours before public comment was closed on Friday. This is deceptive practices. And we've heard on this, at this hearing, um, issues of other deceptive practices. And so at this point in time, I do oppose this project. I would like to also say that, you know, this last minute tactic of changing their designs, um, that the community is expected to co now co come and comment upon. This hearing isn't the hearing to make these comments when there are these designs that we just saw today. We need time to look at these changes. And I actually requested on September 22nd of this year, I emailed Lux Living, asked them to present and submit their development proposal to the 
Forest Park Southeast Development Review Committee and complete a development review application. Lux Living Architect Mike Burkhart <laughs> sent me an email in return stating, we look forward to presenting the development to the Development Review Committee. I believe we'll be shooting for October meeting. Lux Living never followed up on this email to schedule a meeting. Residents in our community deserve respect at all times from developers. I call on the Preservation Board to reject Lux Living's appeal, restart the community comment period and urge Lux Living to go to the Forest Park Southeast Development Review Committee for careful review of this new design that they just submitted on Friday. The Forest Park Southeast Development Review Committee was established to vet developers for their development practices and to provide a closer look at development projects in the Forest Park Southeast neighborhood and provide me detailed input on the new proposed developments. This review committee consists of architects, urban planner, engineer, and an expert on the human impact of community development. As well as myself, I have an architecture degree and I also have a master's in city planning. I also was the vice president and later the president of the Forest Park Southeast Neighborhood Association because it's very important for me to make sure that the community's voice is heard. And this is not the time in which Lux Living is giving the opportunity for the community to have their voice heard. The community Forest Park Southeast Development Review Committee and myself would like to see, as we've heard, to have these new plans presented to us. <coughs> I urge that the Preservation Commission rejects Lux approval and postpone their decision on this project until the developer comes to the community and we are able to do the proper due diligence on this project and speaks to the Forest Park Southeast Development Review Committee and the neighborhood again, if they want to, because this was a bait and switch. Thank you. Thank you, Meg. Is there anyone else? We have no one else. Just Meg, have you that. submitted all the documents that you need for this appeal? Yes. Mike, have you submitted all the documents you need for this appeal? Yes, we have. Okay, thank you very much. Yeah. Commissioner Killeen. Have you got a motion? I move that the Preservation Board uphold the director's denial for the demolition of the seven buildings and withhold preliminary approval for the construction of a seven-story apartment building. Is there a second? second? A second. Motion made and second. Is there any discussion? Hearing none, I will call a roll. Commissioner Hamilton, on the motion, do you vote yes or no? Yes. Commissioner Gilbert, on the motion, do you vote yes or no? Yes. Commissioner Robinson, on the motion, do you vote yes or no? Yes. Alderman Coder, on the motion, do you vote yes or no? Commissioner Colleen, on the motion, do you vote yes or no? Yes. The chair abstains on this vote. There are four yeses, one abstention, and the appeal is denied. Commissioners, we've been at this approximately two hours. Do you want to take a break or do you want to power through another hour? I think I missed my other board meeting. I'm really late, so I can probably just stay at this point. Well, I mean, this, this meeting is gonna probably run a total of another two hours, but the question is, do you, do you wanna take a little break now or do you wanna spend the next hour finishing the rest of the appeals first? I say we keep moving. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> then we will move, calling agenda item F, 1224 Craft Street. <coughs> Now, did, did you want to combine the crafts? Was that it? Uh, yes, Mr. Chairman. Uh, we would very much like to combine these. They are, they are from the same what applicant it, and the same design. So, would it, would it take longer if we separated them? Like, it would. We like five hours to this meeting by separating them? Yes. So, is that what you're proposing? No, let's put them together. <laughs> okay. Let me just find them and we will get to them in just a moment.
Okay, whoops, no, not that one. Okay, we did combine our presentation in anticipation of um, the items being combined. So um, again, I am Meg Lusto with the Cultural Resources Office staff and I swear to tell the truth. Um, I'd like to enter into the record enabling ordinance 64689, preservation review district ordinance 64832 and 66609, the agenda, this PowerPoint and this presentation. Um, this is an appeal of a director's denial for the properties at 1224 and 1230 Craft. And you can see from the slide exactly where those are located. They're in the High Point neighborhood, which is a preservation review area. Um, <clears throat> the request is to demolish these buildings and create and build two new three-story buildings. So I will go through the relevant legislation and switch back and forth between each one. So there are no redevelopment plans for this area. Uh, so that was not applicable. In terms of architectural quality, 1224 craft, which you can see here is a merit structure. It's a modestly detailed example of the shotgun house property type, a one-story brick structure with low sloped roof constructed in 1910. Its two bay front facade presents a transom entry sheltered under a small hipped roof porch and a large flat arched window. Above a turn metal cornice supported by a simple frieze formed by brick dentals and projecting brick string courses. The shaped parapet has simple corner pinnacles and is capped with the terracotta coping. There have been small alterations, the most prominent being glass block in the front basement window. However, they do not significantly affect the house's individual integrity nor its contribution to the streetscape and neighborhood. 1230 Craft <clears throat> is a merit structure. It's a finely detailed example of the shotgun house property type, a one-story brick structure with low sloped roof constructed in 1910. Its two bay front facade presents a single door with transom and an original large three over one story, sorry, three over one window set beneath a steel lintel. Above, a turn metal cornice supported by a simple frieze formed by brick tentals and projecting brick string courses. The shaped parapet has a central gablet and is capped with a molded turn metal. There have been minor alterations. The original gabled porch has been replaced with a plywood enclosure and a front deck constructed, both now very deteriorated, and part of the parapet cap is missing. These changes, however, do not significantly affect the house's individual integrity nor its contribution to the streetscape of the neighborhood. In terms of, uh, here's just a little bit of a streetscape here, you can see 1224 here and 1230 here. Regarding condition, um, we did a visual inspection from the uh, public right of way and the buildings appear to be sound under the definition in the ordinance. Regarding neighborhood effect and reuse potential on this block face. Maybe to go backwards for one second, sure. what is the definition of sound under the ordinance? That the buildings will remain standing for six more months at least. Thank you. Uh, Neighborhood effect and use potential on this block face. The house is one in a row of seven similar small scale brick homes. Um, trying to get to that slide so you can see. Here, that's the entire block you can see. On the rest of this in the facing block, one and two story homes dominate. The exceptions are two homes to the north of the site. Both are newly constructed three story homes with deep setbacks, long driveways and garages on the first floor. Reuse potential. The buildings are situated in Dogtown, High Point specifically, where there is a high volume of real estate activity, both renovation and new construction. The drawbacks to the site are lack of alley access and small sizes of the current buildings. And that is a major factor here. I'll show you now this um, aerial view. You can see that despite alleys being present for most of the other properties, there is no alley access for the back of these buildings. Um, what's being proposed, uh, is this. So uh, the proposed subsequent construction we believe would not be architecturally compatible with the existing block face nor its overall character or exterior materials. The proposal would demolish existing houses at both 1224 and 1230 craft for the construction of two three-story single family buildings. As there is no rear alley to provide vehicular access, the proposed design would provide off-street parking via front entry two car garages facing the street. The front yard of both houses would be excavated and wide driveways slash parking areas created, entirely disrupting the steep terracing of the block. The intervening house at 1228 Craft is not part of this project, and this would be isolated and flanked by high retaining walls on each side of the property. So this house here, you could, it's a little hard to imagine, but they would excavate here and here to create access to this lot, and here and here to create street level access to this lot, leaving this house as something of an island. 
And to give you a general idea of what that would look like, there are um, some similar houses here uh, further up the block. The effect is not as drastic because they're adjacent and there's nothing in between them. And also the, uh, the embankment is not as steep, but on the rest of the block, it does get gradually steeper. So um, our preliminary findings and conclusions, 1224 and 1230 Craft Street are located in a preservation review district. Both buildings appear to be sound under the definition of the ordinance. The buildings are merit structures. The buildings are located in the stable block and have good reuse potential. The proposed subsequent construction would be three-story design with front into garage, not compatible with the existing fabric, and would have an adverse effect on the street face. Based on these preliminary findings, the Cultural Resources Office recommends that the Preservation Board uphold the director's denial of the application to demolish 1224 and 1230 craft as that they do not meet the criteria for demolition under the Preservation Review Ordinance. Um, I should go through a little bit more, though, of the proposed new construction. Um, this would be the front elevation. You can see here, it's not, it doesn't show the entire streetscape, but you can see the retaining walls here and here. So at street level, you would drive into a garage. There wouldn't be pedestrian access or, or pedestrian door at the street level. This would be the rear elevation. Sides would be long and uh, again, very similar to what's existing on the block a little bit further to the north. Um, Here's the site plan. So you can see the driveway here. The garage would be somewhere here. This is the residence itself in the back. And again, this is the exact location. We certainly understand the challenges of the site given the fact, the fact that there's no alley access, but uh, the impact on the block with the excavations would be so profound that we did not believe we could approve demolition at the staff level. Questions for Meg? Wait, could you repeat that last statement again, Meg? Sorry. The implications for the block face, um, these excavations and the interruption of this embankment would be quite profound and would really uh, irreparably change the, the block face and also isolate that one, uh, that one house in the middle. Let me get to that one. So I'm trying to understand a, a district like this. You, you have the authority to like make comments on demolitions, but I mean, what's coming next, is that even something we can consider? In absolutely. This yes, it preservation is. review areas and subsequent new construction is absolutely part of our review process. Yes. Oh, it is. Yeah. But if I had a lot there, I wouldn't have to come to you, right? That's because, correct. Okay. But if you're, if something's coming down, you get to decide or, or you get to take that into consideration what's coming next. That's correct. Okay. Got it. Thank you. And Commissioner Killian, I don't remember were you, were you on the preservation board when we we did slopes down on the riverfront? We did slopes on the riverfront. Remember, remember the Mississippi Bluffs project? Oh yes, yes, I was here for that one. That was one of my favorite meetings. This yeah. is this is close. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Any further questions for Meg? No, sir. Okay. Let's hear from the appellant. Hi, my name is Leila Dodakovic, and I swear to tell the truth. Um, Thank you for your patience. No problem. <laughs> um, uh, so when we bought these properties, honestly, it might have been our fault for not checking in that it's in historic district. Um, but we did see those two houses that were built new, and there were existing houses there before. Um, so the current state of those houses is they i mean you can't fix them up without demoing them in one of them there's literally a tree growing out of the basement through the house um so we are a developer in the st louis city area we've done multiple houses um i talked to meg and we tried to make i think our biggest issue was the driveway the parking um and we tried to figure out if there was any way we could make it work, but since there's no alley there, it's almost next to impossible. Um, so this was our only um, solution. And we did talk about the exterior look of the place, um, like on the existing houses that were built there, uh, it's stucco and we wanted to do stucco, but it, we were willing to uh, negotiate kind of, I guess, negotiate, and we wouldn't mind doing the front face and brick if needed. Um, so, I mean, that's it. I, I really 
it's self-explanatory basically right now. I, I can't hear you, sir. I, I, I know, I just unmuted myself. Okay. Qu questions for the appellant from commissioners? Have you had any contact with the people that own the house in the middle? Uh, yes, and they were actually very excited to get those houses uh, renovated because they've been sitting empty and deteriorating. But you're actually not proposing a renovation, correct? You're proposing a demolition and a new construction. Correct, because the, the existing state of the existing houses, there's, I mean, it's impossible to really save, to be honest, because we are a developer where we do renovation and new, new construction. Um, the foundation is, you, it, it's, I mean, if you went and seen it, I think I submitted some photos to Meg it, it's impossible. So, I mean, I mean, I'm sorry, Commissioner Gilbert. Are you are you finished with the question? Because I I think I've got the same question, which is, what about that house that's going to be stranded in the center because of the excavation? Mr. Um, Chair, yes. If I just may interject, I did attempt to reach the owner of that house in the middle and was unable to. I I'm not sure. I'm sure Mr. Dokovich spoke with someone. It may not have been the owner. I'm not sure what how much of the plans are communicated, but I was not able to reach the owner. I mean, Commissioner Gilbert is reckless with load-bearing walls, as 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 I know from having watched her build in the past. But are Meg, do you have any idea if the that middle house is occupied? It looks like the the address of the owner is not the property address, but do we know if that's a an occupied home? I, I don't have any evidence that it's occupied, but it certainly looks occupied, um, or it does not look unoccupied, I should say. Okay. I have no reason to believe that it's unoccupied. Further questions from commissioners? Hey, Meg, is anybody here to speak? No. Have we heard from neighbors, aldermen, et cetera? Um, I have not gotten any feedback from them. Did we ask them? Um, I not believe a, not a trick question. I swear. I I, I realize that. Um, I honestly am not sure, Mr. Chair. So can I can I just speak for a second? Sure. So there's a house also across the street that another. Um, developers doing that's a good friend of ours um it's the same kind of thing and we had the neighbors around there kind of talk to us and asked us you know what was being what was going to go there and um they were all the people we spoke to at least which was like about three four people they were very excited to see it coming in i i didn't go from house to house to ask honestly um but if needed i could get a petition maybe signed i don't know if that would help any the um probably not okay okay commissioners that concludes the staff presentation. I actually have one more question. Yes. So while it would, we'd have an island house in the middle of the two that the um, petitioner is proposing, but then we'd also have an island house between the two she's proposing and the two that already exist. And so I'm wondering if that person has been spoken to either. So that house, yes. Yeah, that, that's the one I, I was worried about. Are you asking me? Yes, have you, have you spoken to that owner? I I, I personally have not. Um, my boss, he I, I can't say if he spoke to them or not. I don't want to give any false answers, but I know he spoke to a few neighbors there. So if it was that strictly uh, owner, I, don't, I wouldn't be able to verify that. Okay. Okay, thank you. Mr. Chairman, before you go to motion, I have a question uh, for the director. Yeah, sure. Thank you. Um, Meg, is this a, in, in these historic 
or in these type districts where you have this review authority, um, is it common that we talk to the aldermen or, or that we get involved with the neighborhood association? I can't remember ever having dealt with anybody in Dogtown on a project before. I mean, we we when we have time, I, I apologize. We we had a, another packed agenda and uh, did not do everything we should have done. I. Um, when possible, we do. Yes, try to get that kind of feedback. Well, well, I'm not trying to put you on the spot, but I just don't oh, know I if know. downtown has a even has a neighborhood organization that deals with these kind of things, or um, you know, or if the alderman would have an opinion. So, so we don't know. Wait, I don't know. I apologize. No, don't. No apology. Thank you. Since your microphone's already on, Commissioner Colleen, would you like to make a motion? Uh, yeah, I move that we uh, postpone um, a, a postpone action on this and give uh, the developer a chance to talk to the neighbors and the aldermen and see what they think. Come back and see us in a month. This is an appeal. Well, what's our ticking clock situation like, Meg? Sorry, January 16th is our deadline on this one. It sounds like that timeline would work, so I'll second that motion. There's a motion on the floor to made and seconded. Is there any discussion? Well, I, I guess to clarify that motion, it was rather loose. It would be uh, to to have not just um, talking to the neighbors around there, but talking to a, the neighborhood association there in Dogtown, or is it Dogtown, and um, and uh, also to the alderman. Alder person. Okay, I, be I believe that our next meeting is going to be December the 29th. So you think that's enough time? On my behalf? Yes. I'll start on it tomorrow. <laughs> are, you, are you okay with deferring this? Yes, sir. Or do you want us I'm, to vote? I mean, if you want to... I don't know if this is going to make a difference or not, to be honest, you know, like I asked you earlier if I needed to like sign and, you know, I mean, whatever you guys prefer is okay with me. I mean, we just kind of want to get started, you know. There's a motion on the floor commissioners that's been made and seconded. It is to defer consideration of this until our next meeting, which I believe is December the 29th. Commissioner Hamilton, do you vote yes or no? Yes. Commissioner Gilbert, do you vote yes or no? Yes. Commissioner Robinson, do you vote yes or no? Yes. Alderman Coder, yes or no? Alderman, sorry. <laughs> Commissioner Colleen, yes or no? Yes. Chair abstains on this. There are four yeses to defer it. One abstention. The motion carries. We'll hear this again on the 29th. Thank you so much. Do you, know, do you know what you need to do? Yes, sir. Uh, talk to Dogtown Doc Association. Um, I got to figure out where their association is and then uh, contact the alder person and okay. kind of explain to them the situation. We'll be happy to help you with that, Mr. Dokovic. Thank you. Okay. Have a good evening. Thank you. Commissioner Hamilton, you ready, you ready for that break now or are you ready to power through? I want to power through it if we have another hour and a half. <laughs> oh, we are wow. way past my dinner time. I was supposed to be at Oceana board meeting, but it's in clean, but it's okay. <laughs> okay I'll, this I'll, is more this is more fun, Richard. I'll 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 ask you again in a in a couple more items. <laughs> I'll like agenda item J325 North Newstead. If these meetings were in person, would you be obligated to feed us dinner? Yes. They used to feed us cookies and coffee. We brought <laughs> snackies. It was great. You know, in in the in the earliest days, I mean, we sent out the blood and sand and and ate really well. There were <laughs> there were cocktails, appetizers, um, very fancy desserts. I'm 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 just sad that you joined us so so late mm -hmm. in the history of this organization. Yeah, Commissioner <laughs> Robinson, you remember those days? To Christian <laughs> Yes, I do. <laughs> okay, Bob, you ready? Yes, sir. Let's go. Okay, this uh, 
I'm sure it looks familiar to most of you. I believe everybody here was at the last meeting. Um, the situation here, um, the roof on the building uh, was, they started to replace the clay tile roof with a gray asphalt shingle. Mm -hmm. There was a, uh, I went out to stop work on them, worked with the applicants. Long story short, they came to the board last month to, for a variance to try and do a gray um, shingle roof on this building. The board denied that request. So they are now back with a green shingle roof, which will I'll show you a picture of it later. So since it's a different material color, we, we allow them to come back again. Um, they've also you should got a packet with information from the applicants in regards to bids and financial statements in regards to how their operation works. So we'll go through this again really quickly here. This is the property in question. And before I start, sorry, um, Bob Bettis with staff will tell the truth. Uh, entering the enabling ordinance 64689 as amended by 69423, the Central West End Ordinance 56768 as amended by 69423, my presentation and the staff report. Proceed. Proceed. Again, here's context. Uh, the roof, uh, this is the blank question, Newstead and Pershing, just north of the new cathedral. Another shot of the roof. Here's some ground level context. This is a shot um, from the street when there's leaves on the trees, a little obscured. And this is a shot as, as in the winter time. This uh, photograph shows you the area on the roof that was already replaced prior to the stop work being issued. And this is a close up shot of the tile roof that was starting to remove. And on the right is the new proposed shingle. And in terms of the code, um, even though the color is closer and aligning with you know, what was there originally, it still does not meet the standards. The standards say if you have existing historic material, you need to replace it to match in kind or get as close as possible if you can't repair what's up there. So um, as before, even though the color is, is closer, staff still cannot approve this. And, and of course we recommend denial on a report. Um, can I show you some more photographs just so we have some context? I know the applicant will probably want me to go through these again. This is the current condition of the roof. Some interior shots showing some damage. This is just an example of the gray shingle. From This is from before, I apologize. Again, this is a shot of the proposed shingle. And this is the points of contention. One of the things that I had asked for a few times was could they consolidate good tile to the front slope? And as you can see, um, uh, this is also, and I believe sent to you as well, they don't think there's enough salvageable tile to even do the front slope of the roof that faces North Newstead. So that's, how, that's what they contend. But we did ask them to do that. So they did a, at least that. So again, given, um, even though it's a different color, staff still recommends that the board uphold the director's denial as the um, green shingle roof does, and material does not comply with the Central West End Historic District Standards. I know Mr. Dwyer is here to speak on the item uh, from the neighborhood, but I believe um, the applicant is here to speak in more detail about the financial aspects. All right, commissioners, questions, uh, Bob? Okay, let's let's hear from the appellant again. Bill, I see you're here. Uh, good evening, I'm Bill, right with Catholic Charities. Um, I had our, um, our president, Jared Bryson, did submit a a letter on behalf of uh, stating the financial uh, makeup before of our you, before you begin to testify before you begin before? to testify before you begin to testify is your testimony going to be the truth yes sir okay proceed so um yes we we did our contractor did some work and we did try to figure out the best solution um the, the green tile that we did come up with that's what we're requesting we get permission to put on there our um, our president did submit a financial disclosure record um, in form of a letter to this commission 
um, basically outlining the, the financial nature of the agencies that are uh, housed in this building and that they can't afford to pay for this roof. If we were to uh, have to pay the additional some $700,000, that's money that's directly taken from the, the poor and indigent that we care for in the city of St. Louis. And so he highlighted in that letter um, that we would have to divert those services somewhere else to that would create an additional hardship to other city uh, services that do support these uh, poor and indigent that we care for. Is there more to your appeal? Um, I, I think our, our roofer contractor is also Christian is on the on the line as well, and I think he might have had some points to make about the the green tile roof. Okay, thank you. Where's, where's the roof? I'm here. Thank you. Tell us your name, please. Uh, Christian. You have, you have, you have a, uh, any other name, or are you like Madonna? No, I'm a Christian, no matter what. That's what I go by. <laughs> well, that, that won't be sufficient for this meeting. We'll actually need a name and your oath. I'm, I, I apologize, sir. I'm not understanding. Uh, Christian Harbart, you want my last name? Yes, please. Oh, I apologize. I didn't understand that. That's fine. And, and your, is your testimony going to be the truth? Yes, sir. Okay, proceed. Okay, so I did send some over to Bob, kind of outlining the difference in, in pricing. I think if, if he has that, maybe that could be shown uh, where I kind of outlined the different options for them and pricing points. Um, some things were mentioned about synthetic products, which might be a happy medium, but unfortunately there's really no synthetic tile. Synthetic would be not actually clay, a little bit cheaper, uh, kind of in the middle, but they make synthetic slate, which this is not slate, and they make synthetic shake, and this is not shake. Um, I pretty much scoured the earth to find some, but even at that, even at th that product, if it did exist, that's about three quarters of a million dollars compared to 300,000. Um, the tile roof is somewhere around a million, and it's a year. It's a year, so I did. I don't know if, uh, if you guys have it. I have it somewhere. I don't know if I could share it now, but I forwarded uh, on to. That was forwarded in your packet. The, there's a breakdown of the the prices and the materials. Yeah. So the timeline, basically, even to get tile, if they could afford it, it's about a year, and the roof's very dilapidated and leaking all over the place. So when we started this process, and we did we did consider tile. This was in the heart of COVID and materials were hard to come by. So not only was tile not affordable, it definitely wasn't available. So our, our options to replace this roof when they signed this contract were very minimal. So we wanted, we made it to the green shingle, which wasn't available. So we finally, when they finally started making it again, they made the shingle, but they only made it in colonial slate, which is not green. So if we had the choice of anything, we would have picked the green shingle for sure, but materials and supplies at the time and even now are just so so hard to come by. Uh, but in the midst of this, basically, uh, this green became available. Very limited, very limited supply. So uh, that's why we're kind of pushing for this. It seems to to me it looks. I know it's not the same material, but it does resemble the tile. It has the same kind of dimensions and exposure, and uh, it, it's quality. It's, it's a very high quality shape for the price. So it's used a lot of times. I guess that one building doesn't show it green, but that was just kind of demonstrate that you know churches and, and historical and architectural buildings. This is what they use in the U.S. tile a lot of times. So was there anything else? Uh, I believe I believe that's all I have. Did you bring anybody else with you? As long as everybody, you know, did get to read the actual price point and the timelines, 
on the roof. Okay. Questions for the appellants, commissioners? I actually have a question maybe for the director. In the packet we received, there's a Ludo, do Ludo Witchy, Miranda, Clothes, yeah. that one, the one that's a million dollars or right. you know, 950. Would that be approved? Most likely, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, it's that a cost, is, yeah. gotcha. That's sort of the product that you all would be looking for from a historic standpoint. And so, the claim here is economic hardship because that product is so much more expensive than anything else. I'm just seeking clarification. Okay, thank you. If, if I may interject, and uh, it's, it's also timeline too. So time, time is somewhat of the essence uh, as as for replacements. Gotcha. Further questions for appellants? Okay, Bob, who's here to speak? Oh, we have uh, Jim Dwyer. Hello, Mr. Dwyer. Good evening. Mr. Chairman, <laughs> I uh, Phil, wondering when this is going to move from your second favorite meeting to first in line. Oh, probably about five o'clock tomorrow morning when we get done. All right. Well, I, I'm going to try not to contribute to the uh, to that equation. Take, take your time. All right. I and will tell, be us, tell us your name and swear, please. Yes, my name is James Dwyer, and I swear to tell the truth. Proceed. Uh, I have three quick comments. Uh, there is in the record of the Preservation Board a letter dated October 21st, 2022, that we submitted with regard to this project. And I would like the, the contents of that letter to be reintroduced uh, into the record as a part of this hearing. Is, I think is, the, it is it a long letter, Mr. Dwyer? Well, it's a page and a paragraph. You want, you want to read any relevant section to remind us? Well, just yes. I, yes, thank you for that. Um, the letter states what is clear to everyone, and that is that the standards require that repair, uh, repair is preferable to replacement unless documentation is provided demonstrating the conditions are sufficiently de de deteriorated that repair is determined to be impractical. And I will acknowledge that that appears to be the case here. But it goes on, the standards go on to say, in which case original or historic roof materials shall, not my word, shall be used wherever the roof is visible from the street. When we met in October, my sense at the end of the presentation was that the applicant, the applicant's contractor, and the cultural resources office staff were going to collaborate in an effort to determine um, a suitable compromise material that would come close to meeting the standards, but perhaps would not come all the way to satisfying the standards. I'm not sure whether that has been accomplished and therefore there is a, an unknown that is I think relevant, but more important to me is the, uh, the, the concept that the uh, financial, that financial hardship should be a reason for being excused from the requirements of, of the the standards, and I'm thinking back to the presentation earlier today, two presentations earlier today, having to do with affordability. And it just seems clear to me that um, it, to the extent that that were to become um, an acceptable means of avoiding what is otherwise required, that as I think Commissioner Colleen said earlier tonight, um, pretty soon everyone will show up claiming hardship. And so I think Commissioner Hamilton's uh, concern about standards and that, uh, and others supported her, her concern about that, um, I think is, is critical. And I would encourage the Cultural Resources Office to explore the development of standards that would somehow make this a manageable topic. With regard to this building, 
it is clear from the photographs how dominant its presence is in the community. And therefore, because of that dominance, perhaps there, it is even more important that the standards be honored. There was some question raised in the initial meeting in October about the actual ownership of the building. I remember Commissioner Richardson was inquiring about whether it is owned by the archdiocese or not. And it seemed clear, and it does from the, the records that I've looked at, that the building is owned by the archdiocese. So to the extent that that would make any difference, I think it is important to note that. And to be a little dramatic about it, if, if the material is not required to be replaced in like kind, then one could imagine that one day, um, whoever is in charge years from now might decide that the Cathedral Basilica does not, um, is a hardship situation and that the green tile on the roof of that fabulous building uh, could be replaced with asphalt shingles. So it's a slippery slope. And I think that all of that needs to be considered. Um, so my question to the Cultural Resources Office staff, to Bob Bettis would, would be, is there any other material that either the staff or the roofing contractor is aware of that is more suitable than that which is proposed and if so, what are the financial dynamics of that? Sure, and just so you know, Jim, I, I we after the last meeting, Bob, had a for, for purposes of this meeting, oh, pretend sorry. that I pretend that I ask that question of you, sir, Mr. Callow. Um, after the last meeting, I had a lengthy discussion with Bill and also with Christian about options and and how to proceed. Uh, I, I think it was it was pretty clear early on, and again, this is their prerogative that that. The price point was going to drive their final decision. We just, you know, we discussed EcoStar, which is a, a synthetic material, you know, kind of like a plastic slate. Those things are definitely more palatable than this, but they are a substantially higher price point. Uh, Mr. Dwyer, you may not be aware, um, but there we they did price out the various um, composite items that could go up there, and they were substantially higher than what is being proposed today upwards of $250,000 more than, than the asphalt shingle. We had the discussion and it was their right to, to proceed. We did try and find a big ground, but there really is no way to do that when price is driving their final goal. So staff can only give them so much, but they can't, I can't make them, you know, go with a much higher priced item, but they have the right to appeal. So we did try to talk. Thank you for that. Do anybody else here, Bob? Uh, no, sir. Okay. Commissioners, that concludes our testimony. We've heard from staff. We've heard from the appellant, Commissioner Colleen. Have you got a motion? Sir, I'm sorry. I was muted. May I say one last thing? Who's, who's speaking? This is Christian. Yes. Um, and I just, I, I, would, I wish it was in the display, but honestly, the synthetic items, I mean, to call them comparable or more expensive, but slate and shake are not the same as tile. They're not, shake is wood and simulated shake is plastic that's made to look like wood and simulated slate is plastic that's made to look like slate. Slate's thin and hammered, shake's thick and has wood grain in it and grooves. So to be honest, if we're trying to make it look comparable, there's only these shingles and then there's tile. Okay. And the tile was a million dollars and the shingles are $300,000. So basically that's the two options on the table if, if you want it to look the same. Thank you, Christian. Yes, sir, thank you. Commissioner Killeen, I'm sorry. Do you have a motion? Oh, no, that's okay. I appreciate the, the additional information. I have a question for staff before I make a motion. So, Bob, you're saying um, that there is there is no compromise solution here. It's either they get the Ludoichi or what they have in front of us here. Well, if if you're saying what can we approve outright, then it's it's that Ludoichi tile. Yeah, that's what we can approve. The, 
the code isn't does not give us the flexibility at staff level to approve anything really but that. Um, Christian's right in that if they were to go with a slate composite, it may have better depth than what you're seeing with the architectural. Um, it might be a middle ground that the board would see as palatable, but I can't see how staff could, you know, say it's there's a great middle ground product that's going to work. But that has not been presented to us today. Well, again, you had a packet which sent a few items in in terms of like EcoStar, and that was given to you as kind of like a, a baseline for those products. Um, so there's not one specific item that would be a middle one to show you to discuss at length, which I don't believe because there's no color comparison. There, you know, you're missing some items. I think what was sent to you was based on the price, the lead time, that sort of thing. Gotcha. Um, okay, thank you. I move the preservation board overturn the director's denial and allow the tiles to be installed as presented. Is there a second? Yeah, let's see what we have there. Commissioner, I hear no second. Second. Commissioner, I hear a second. Discussion? Well, um, this is a tough one. Um, I, it's rare that I uh, don't agree with Mr. Dwyer on something, and this is a close one, but it's just when I hear about a $700,000 difference and these folks are taking care of the poor, um, it's it's tough to to argue against um, this change, and it isn't it just as if they put it in illegally and are asking for forgiveness. They, they, you know, they are coming to us before it's installed. So I, that's I think not a, that's not exactly true, isn't it? True that there was a stop work order. Right. Yeah. One slope of the roof had begun prior to us. I, mean, I went on to stop work on the, that. The demolition had begun, but yeah, I, I agree. Uh, Commissioner, that yeah, right. The, to your clarification, but none of this has been installed yet, though, has it, Bob? That is correct. Right. Who who owns the building? Because Mr. Dwyer said, "Who owns the building?" I I, I think for purposes of shorthand, the answer is the archdiocese. So do they are do they have a, do they have a budget or? You know, Commissioner, you. You 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 raise you raise a good question. I appreciated your discussion earlier because we were presented with an appellant who was clearly from her clearly from her testimony um, likely to be able to raise a an argument for hardship, and she just didn't have anything there with her. Right. Um, I don't think that that's the case here. Uh, yeah. So that's why I'm wondering because Archdiocese, don't they have a huge, don't they have a lot of money? So, I mean, there might be a price difference, but if we're talking about this type of building and you're talking about the Basilica and all of that, I mean, maybe we can, I, I don't want to give them a break if they can afford it. I, yeah, maybe Catholic Charity St. Louis can't, but if the Archdiocese owns it, I'm pretty sure they can, they can afford a new roof. I, I, I actually found persuasive some testimony that I thought Bob made in which he said that there might be other alternatives that they weren't before us and that what was before us was the contrast that we were being presented with. If right, we, you, I'm sorry. Or even if we could come to um, some sort of understanding, because I do understand time is of the essence and with these roofs, the longer time goes by, the more damage it does. So I completely understand that testimony. At the same time, um, maybe we should look at some other options or something that maybe everyone can come to a conclusion to. Um, I don't know if, if time permits, but that's what I would feel comfortable with. Further discussion, commissioners? This is Christian, are we done? We're not allowed to speak now. That's right. Okay. I apologize. Yeah, I'm I'm sort of with Commissioner Hamilton. I'm not sure that the economic part is not Mr. <laughs> Sorry, I said commissioner, I, I believe. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, I am not sure I am like necessarily convinced by the economic hardship argument. I think I would need more evidence to believe that. I know it's a it's a lot of money. I agree. 
but like a quick Google tells me the annual income of Catholic charities and it's, you know, 20 times what this cost is. So I'm having trouble like rationalizing that with the $3,000 windows of a few people, the appellate a few before. So I don't know. I just, I don't feel like I have enough evidence to uh, support the economic hardship claim at this point. Further discussion? Okay, commissioners, the motion on the floor is to overturn the denial and to uphold the appeal. I'm going to call a roll. I have lost my old roll sheet, I'm afraid. So I'll be calling from a different roll sheet and in a slightly different order. Commissioner Robinson, do you vote yes or no? Uh, no. Commissioner Hamilton, do you vote yes or no? No. Commissioner Colleen, do you vote yes or no? Yes. Commissioner Gilbert, do you vote yes or no? No. Who have I overlooked? This coder buddy's gone. Okay. So commissioners, I count uh, and the chair abstains on this motion. I count, nope, I count three no's, one yes, the motion fails. Commissioner Gilbert, would you like to make another motion? I motion to uphold the director's denial uh, to replace the green tile clay roof with green fiberglass architectural shingles. Is there a second? Second. Motion made and seconded. Is there any further discussion? Hearing none. Calling the roll again. Commissioner Robinson, do you vote yes or no? Yes. Commissioner Hamilton, do you vote yes or no? Yes. Commissioner Colleen, do you vote yes or no? No. Commissioner Gilbert, do you vote yes or no? Yes. The chair abstains again. There's three yeses, one no, one abstention, and the motion carries. The appeal is denied. Thank you, commissioners. Commissioner Hamilton, you want that break yet? We have like a three minute break to stretch and go to the restroom. Yes. <laughs> commissioners, we stand adjourned for several minutes. Mm -hmm.
Bob, we ready? Yes, sir. Okay, I'm going to call a roll, which I found. Commissioner Hamilton, are you here? Here. Commissioner Gilbert, are you here? Here. Commissioner Robinson, are you here? Here. Mr. Colleen, are you here? Here. And I am still present. We still have a quorum. We will continue until we don't. Thank you for your patience, everyone. Calling agenda item K, 3913 FLAD. Okay. Again, Bob Bettis with staff. I'll still tell the truth. I uh, need to enter in the enabling ordinance 64689, as amended by 69423, the Shaw Ordinance, which is 59400, my presentation and the staff report. Uh, this one's relatively straightforward. Uh, the applicant has proposed to install five vinyl windows on the second story of the east facade, and that is highlighted here above the roof of neighboring property. Context, here's your street level context. And this kind of highlights the street visibility of the windows. Uh, staff does believe that these are street visible windows under the ordinance. Here's a close up shot of the windows that are closest to the street. And again, this is a, a view looking back towards the property from the middle of the street. Um, the proposal calls for placing the five wood windows with five vinyl windows. Four of the five windows are two over two, and there's a single one over one. The vinyl windows in the application are all one over one vinyl windows. The application also calls for the wrapping of the wooden brick molds and the, the sill. So per the ordinance, uh, staff use the use of vinyl material on a street visible window is not compliant. And then in terms of detail, we're losing the two over two windows, and they're also going to conceal the wooden elements with the wrapping. So staff believes on those counts, the proposal does not comply. Um, we do have um, there's a letter of support from the Shaw neighborhood group in support of the applicant. Um, so given what I've outlined for you, staff recommends that the board uphold the director's denial for the five vinyl windows and trim wrapping as the work does not comply with the Shaw Local Historic District Standards. Questions for staff by commissioners? So just to clarify, Bob, is vinyl allowed anywhere in the district? Like at the rear, would it have been allowed? Or Yeah, not? or a narrow gangway. Yeah, as long, but staff use it since it's, you know, since above the neighboring property, it's, it's, it's highly visible. Got like it, the applicant you. is proposing to do windows on the, on the gangway side, which are fine. Got it, thank you. Yes, sir. Further questions? Okay, let's hear from the appellant. Hello. Hi, I'm Mary Hello. Drake, and I promise to tell the truth. Proceed. Yes. Um, first of all, we are not fly-by-night landlords, my husband and myself. I've lived in the neighborhood my whole life, and my husband's lived here for 55 years. We have owned and lived in the rental property for 45 years. We currently own the three in a row the two to the west of the building we're talking about. Another house further down the block is literally falling apart. The new windows we propose would save the clients on utilities. It would be less maintenance for us. The window is less expensive, so the rents won't need to increase as much. And we try to have affordable housing in the city. The pictures that um, we're showing of the five windows, they were taken from the street and say not even on the sidewalk. So I think really many people driving by do not even notice the windows. The roof of the houses next door cover much of the windows. And on the picture where it's the two windows that you have to be pretty up close to see those. And by the time you get up there, then you're so close to the building that you really don't see the sides of the windows. Um, my building is not at the corner. And like I said, the house next door is a one-story house, but it does have the pointed roof. And in passing um, and asking people what are windows even look like, I don't think a lot of them would be able to tell you even that they have the two panels up there. And I just um, wish that you would um, think about us having the windows we proposed. Commissioners, questions for the appellant? 
So, um, Ms. Brick, I'm sure you've heard a lot about um, financial hardship and all that tonight. Is that something you're uh, presenting here, too, that these are not affordable to put them in per code? No, we were not doing that, but um, they are they are more expensive, definitely, than the other ones. Um, they're about $800 more than the, the window that we were choosing. Per um, window? Mm -hmm, yes. I mean, yes, if we had to, we have the money for it. But then there again, too, then that when it's next year for lease renewal times, we would have to take that in consideration for the renters, too, about, OK, what do we need to raise the rent just to help cover our maintenance and things? And we do try to keep our rents um, definitely not the highest in the neighborhood. And we take very good care of our property. Thank you. Further questions for the appellant? Oh, I do have one other thing though, too. Go ahead, Ms. Bray. That we have been, um, we complied with the intent of the regulation, that we haven't gone and put windows in and then be told, no, this isn't right, that, that we've gone through the right path to do it. Sorry, I can hear my cat. <laughs> Any, anybody else signed up to speak? No, sir. Okay. Commissioner Hamilton, have you got a motion? I, ga I, gave, I gave you the chance to go to Oceana. Did you go? No. <laughs> Are they having a good time? Yes, they texted me. <laughs> I know. <laughs> oh, gosh. I hate this because you, I mean, you go, oh, she's doing the right thing and you can't really see the windows from the uh, would you would you rather she have was so Kelly? truthful that it's not a hardship but then the shaw it goes against the shaw guidelines Ugh. it's 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 nice seeing the inside of your mind do you want i know i'm kind of <laughs> this. do you want commissioner so, like, look at her she's like staring at me she's staring at me oh my god <laughs> i won't look <laughs> Uh, I mean, Comm Commissioner who's on the side, who's on the side, you can't, okay, I'm going to, in the roof line, I'm going to make a motion and then you guys can have at it with discussion. Because I'm, I'm like split. Um, my motion is that the preservation board overturn the director's denial of the application and has proposed the vinyl windows and wrapping of wood trim is not compliant with local Shaw standards. Have at it. Let's see if we oh. got a second. Let's see if we got I'll a second. I'll second it. Okay, there's a second. Discussion? Okay, other, other than Commissioner Hamilton, who has already discussed it? <laughs> Commissioner Killeen, is, is this a slippery slope you saw? I'm still thinking. I'm going to say pass. Come back to me. But it's okay. not just slippery slope because she told the truth. She said, I have the money. So she I told agree. the truth, which is very respectable. It's on the and side. The windows are on the side, though. And it's covered. The, the roof is kind of, you wouldn't really notice. And I agree that it is also not her fault that those two properties <laughs> just to the left are not historic. If the historic properties were still there, then you wouldn't even be able to see the windows. Presumably, originally, you wouldn't have even seen that facade because those buildings would have been taller. <laughs> Commissioner Robinson, I, I, I see your eyebrows way up there. Um, yeah. Um, <laughs> those are good arguments, I suppose. <laughs> I like that as a comment. Further, further discussion, commissioners? <laughs> Okay, there is a motion on the floor that's been made and seconded. I'm, I am going to call a roll for the vote. Commissioner Hamilton. Yes. The, is that yes, you're answering me or your vote is yes? My vote is yes. Commissioner Gilbert. Yes. Commissioner Robinson. I, I'm thinking. Okay, take your time. Commissioner Hamilton says she has no place to go. 
Commissioner not Hamilton anymore. Says, not anymore. Commissioner Hamilton. Comm Commissioner Gilbert says her husband's at a party. She's got nowhere to go. <laughs> Yes. Commissioner Killeen. Yes. Chair abstains on this vote. There are four yeses, one abstention. The motion carries. Thank you. Thank you. Commissioners, look looking looking down our agenda. There is a quick business that we could knock out. Meg, what has happened to agenda item L or Bob? Um, L, that's the nomination. It has been um, removed for consideration for this month. Okay. We're asking him to remove it. I'm sorry. We're asking him to remove it. We're asking him to remove it. Yeah. The, the nomination is being, re is being edited uh, at the request of SHPO. So um, we're asking it to be removed. Okay. An agenda item M, which is a landmark petition. Who wrote that one? That was Andre Gagan, who is prepared to. Uh, Speak on that. Okay. Let's hear it. Tell her we can't hear. Yes. Okay. Um, this is the uh, nomination for city landmark for the Rosati Kane High School um, that we heard about last meeting. Um, and we are just asking that the preservation board sit. Uh, send it to the uh, Planning Commission and the Board of Public Service for review. Simultaneously? Yes. Cool. Does anybody else need to have the facts of the nomination rehearsed? Okay, Chair moves that this board directs staff to forward the petition to the Planning Commission and the Board of Public Service. Is there a second? Second. <clears throat> All those in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? Hearing none, send it along, Dan. Ajay. Andrea, thank you. Well, there. Okay, commissioners. Moving to oh, we might we might as well, in case we lose people, discuss the January preservation board meeting date. Meg. Yes. What is our discussion? <laughs> well, uh, of course, we'll defer to the wishes of the Preservation Board, but um, we note that the November meeting was pushed to tonight because of conflicts with Thanksgiving holidays. We have upcoming holidays in December, which could complicate our regular, actually would almost totally prevent our regular board meeting, which is the fourth Monday of the month, and that falls on December 26, which is a city holiday. Um, looking further into January, January 2nd, which is the first Monday of the month, is also a city holiday for New Year's Eve. And then January 16th, two Mondays from then, is Martin Luther King Day. So um, we don't, of course, have to have a meeting on a Monday. There's no regulation about that. So uh, the Preservation Board is free to choose whatever date it wants for its next meeting. Are we trying to set a December meeting or a January meeting? Um, what, whether, December it's in, whether it's in December or in January. <laughs> Well, this would, in theory, be the December meeting that might be pushed to January as the November meeting was. I think you just froze. Mm -hmm. She did. Oh, now she's unfrozen. We did not hear you. Oh, you didn't hear me? No. Oh, I apologize. Um, this could be the de December meeting pushed to January, much as the November meeting was pushed to December. It's really just up to the preservation board what date they want. Did were you the person who texted me December 29th? No. Okay. Commissioners, when do you want to have a December meeting? <laughs> Commissioner Wait, Hamilton, what, uh, Commissioner what Hamilton, is? we're not asking you because we know you're going to be on vacation no matter when it is. No, not until Martin Luther King weekend. I'll be here until then. <laughs> okay. So what, what, what days of the week work for you all? Commissioner Colleen? Oh, I'm looking at this, Mr. Mr. Chairman. Uh, the 29th you mentioned works fine for me. Um, it doesn't have to be a Monday as far as I'm concerned. I don't know if we can do that with the ordinance. We can. Commissioner 
Robinson, does 29th work for you? Give me just a second here. Yes. Commissioner Gilbert? It works for me. Commissioner Hamilton? Yes. Okay, I, I, I feel since we managed to stay through the meeting and other people did not even come to the meeting or left early, that, that we'll get our say and we should set this meeting for December the 29th unless a quorum disappears. Is that okay? Here, here. Yes. Okay, then. That's fine. As soon as you lose. Let us, let us then proceed to the preliminary review, calling first of all, 2601 Market Street. Let me just get back to that part of the agenda. And commissioners, this, this meeting will continue till we're done or until we lose a quorum. Give me just one moment. Sure. Okay. okay. So um, this project, this is a preliminary review. Sorry, this is Meg Lusto from the Cultural Resources Office. This is a preliminary review for the proposed demolition of parts of the Wells Fargo complex at the old Wells Fargo complex, I should say, at the intersection of Market and Jefferson at 2601 Market and the construction of two new hotels at that site. Um, 2601 Market Street is located in the Preservation Review District where the Cultural Resources Office and the Preservation Board have jurisdiction over demolition applications and the building is a merit structure per the definition in Ordinance 64689. Looking at relevant legislation, um, there is no redevelopment plan for the area so that does not apply. Architectural quality, uh, 2601 Market is a merit building. It's a five-story reinforced, sorry, let me get to some pictures. Uh, this is the, the structure in question. It's, uh, we'll get to a diagram later that shows you exactly which parts are proposed for demolition. I'm sure this is also at a very high profile intersection. Most of you are very familiar with this location. Uh, and I'll then show you the original building. And then this is the original building. That's the 1975 edition. Here is a site plan. So. Um, a five-story reinforced concrete structure. The first building on the site was designed in 1968 for A.G. Edwards by the prominent St. Louis architectural firm of Raymond Merritts and Sons. It was a seven-story office block, its front facade facing North Jefferson. In 1975, an addition was made at a 90-degree angle to the original structure, the design nearly mirroring that of the original building. Finally, in 1985, a larger addition was completed at the northeast corner. This work included a new primary entry on the south elevation. All projects were the work of Merritts and Sons. 2601 Market was among those structures documented in the mid-century modern survey undertaken by the Cultural Resources Office in 2017. It was considered to have both moderate architectural interest and moderate historic interest, but was not among the 25 most highly rated St. Louis mid-century modern properties. Condition of the building, um, we determined the building is sound. In terms of reuse, uh, we note that the potential for reuse of a large office building is questionable in current economic conditions. We do also note that the conditions of structures surrounding the project are excellent with little to no vacancy. This is a heavily trafficked and robust commercial area with resources that reflect two distinct development phases. The first, a number of medium scale offices in the 1960s. The second, high rise office buildings built between 1980 and 2001. We note again that the building's reuse potential may be lessened due to the shrinking market for large office buildings and the cost of conversion to other uses, to residential or other uses. In terms of economic hardship, uh, not, not applicable here. Uh, now moving on to proposed subsequent construction. Again, this is the plan for demolition. So large portions would stay. The stepped back uh, glass tower would stay. It's simply the 1968, 1965 and 1975 portions and that connector that would, uh, that would go away. So the proposed new construction, the proposal is to construct two seven-story hotels. The Kimpton, which you see here at the corner of Market and North Jefferson, 
and the Staybridge Suites at the northwest corner of the site fronting on Beaumont. You get a better idea of the overall plan here. The Kimpton would, would directly address the street, its base displaying a wide extent of storefront glazing at the corner and iron spot brick on the remainder of the facade. Above, a projecting covered balcony extends on both the east and south elevations and shelters both the main entry part and part of the sidewalk. It's accessible by an operable glass wall for guests to congregate along both sides of the building. A projecting glazed corner element rises four stories on the street elevations, both of which present 10 bays of large windows set within a facade of metal panels. The building is crowned by a wide recessed balcony, again on both elevations. Materials would be ephus, stucco, gray metal panels, and iron spot brick. Red brick appears on the hotel's rear elevation that faces uh, west towards the adjacent Staybridge to visually integrate the two different designs. The Staybridge Suites building, also seven stories, is clad in the same materials, iron spot brick, ephus, and metal panels, but here the red brick of the Kimpton's rear elevation is far more prominent, appearing in shallowly projecting bays on the west primary facade, south, and sheathing the pro projecting stair tower in its north elevation. The project proposed development would bring vitality to the area where downtown west meets midtown and can serve as an impetus for future development in the area. So preliminary findings and conclusions. Uh, we find that 2601 Market is located in a preservation review area. The building is a merit structure in good condition and sound under the definition of the preservation review ordinance. 2601 Market, designed in 1968 by the prominent St. Louis architectural firm Raymond Merritts and Sons, has received two large additions, one in 1975 and another larger one in 1985. Although both were designed by the Merritts firm and are compatible in form and materials to the original structure, the original appearance has been compromised. The reuse potential of 2601 Market is questionable given current economic conditions and the less than desirability of large office buildings. The proposed subsequent construction would be of equal or exceeding value to 2601 Market and would bring greater vitality to what is now an austere and pedestrian unfriendly intersection. So based on these preliminary findings, the Cultural Resources Office recommends that the Preservation Board grant preliminary approval to the demolition of 2601 Market as it meets the requirements of the Preservation Review District Ordinance Criteria F subsequent new construction. Commissioners, questions of staff? Okay, is the applicant here? Yes, this is David Robert. Um, I'm telling the truth. And um, I think staff did a good, nice job of presenting our project. I would be happy to answer any questions you may have. <clears throat> questions, commissioners? Uh, Mr. Robert, did you, did you all explore the possibility of reusing those buildings uh, for the hotel? Yes, sir, we did. Uh, that was our original plan, uh, but the buildings had been vacant for a while and it really did not lay out very well. And if you know the buildings now, they're an L-shaped building um, and the, the bays were much, the, the, plant, the floor plans were very big, so they didn't lay out very well for hotel. Uh, but there's a parking lot right now on the corner of Jefferson and Market, and we felt like that, and so the buildings are currently set back, and we felt like it was more important to bring the building right out to the corner, and so that's why we decided at the end of the day that we needed to, to start over. Okay, thank you. Further questions from commissioners? Yeah, am I understanding this um, site plan correctly that there is no curb cut on Jefferson? There, there is a curve cut on Jefferson, yes. Into the service drive, though. I'm sorry, I should have clarified. That that sort of like long, skinny piece there is a continuous sidewalk there that kind of blocks the drop-off. Is that correct? The so circle? You, as you pull in off of Jefferson, you'll make an immediate left where it says garage access, and you'll pull in underneath the garage there. The Kempton entrance is actually over off of Beaumont. And so you would you would come in, make a off market, make a right onto Beaumont. That's the state bridge where it says Kimpton Motor Court right there in the middle. That's actually the Kimpton drop off right there. So that's the Kimpton entrance right there. The state bridge entrance is to the left where it says right there where the cursor is. That's the state bridge entrance up there. So there is a garage underneath. So there's a one level of parking below grade that's access you access off Jefferson. Okay, Commissioner. 
further questions from commissioners? Meg, has anybody shown up to speak for this? Remain to speak for this? No. We have Arrive to speak for this? No. Okay. Commissioners, that concludes this presentation. Commissioner Gilbert, have you got a motion? Sure. I um, motion to that the preservation board grant preliminary approval for the demolition of these two buildings to construct the new seven story hotels. Is there a second? I have a I second can. with a suggested uh, addition to your uh, motion, which is that um, contingent upon uh, the uh, acquisition of building permit. Great. You're allowed to demo. And Commissioner Kalani, you have a second motion. Is that a demo permit we'd have to get our building permit? That'd building. be a building permit. So we can't demo them until we get a building permit? That's correct. We've just, just to be uh, clear, Mr. Robert, we've had uh, folks uh, uh, tear down buildings and say they're going to build things and then they don't get built. So we we oftentimes for big projects like this require you know that we see that building permit so we know you're really going forward and do you see that being a problem with with your uh workflow there i mean the, the intent was sir just being honest was to get the buildings the buildings down while the design is being finished we're not we're not ready to pull a building permit yet we've got we're not completely full fully designed from an engineering standpoint so we couldn't pull a building permit for months we were hoping to get started with the project through demolition. I, I understand your concern. Um, I get that. Um, that's not our intent at all. We're fully vested in doing this project and we're trying to get started. Commissioners, there's a motion on the floor that's been made and seconded. I'm gonna call a roll. Commissioner Hamilton, do you vote yes or no? Yes. Commissioner Gilbert, do you vote yes or no? Yes. Commissioner Robinson, do you vote yes or no? The the motion was with with uh building permit. On a building permit. Yes. Commissioner Colleen, do you vote yes or no? Yes. Chair abstains on this vote. There are four yeses, one abstention. The motion carries. Thank you, commissioners. Am I correct that 2680 McNair is no longer on the agenda? That's correct. Okay, calling agenda item C, 2904, Wisconsin. Commissioner Colleen, you're recusing yourself? That's correct. Okay. Okay, and this'll be, this'll be a fast one. Um, you actually know about this project. Um, back in 2020, um, started COVID, the, uh, there was an application for the new construction of a single family house on this location. Um, at that time, the design had support of the aldermen and the neighborhood group. So given the start of COVID, trying to keep pres board agendas relatively small, um, th at that time, that director approved it over the counter, um, essentially, uh, well, granted plenty of approval for it. Um, he did report in his director's report at the June 29th, 2020 meeting that he had approved it. So you were aware of the general project prior. So time has lapsed. We have to have a new, it's been a couple of years now. So that's expired. We have to come back for you with the design again. Um, there has been some small tweaks to it, um, which were pretty much on the rear of the building in terms of material usage. So overall, it's not really a, a very um, substantial change and staff is okay with it. Just really quickly, we'll kind of go through this. Here is the proposed site plan. This is the location. Here is the proposed site plan again, showing the adjacent buildings. Uh, these are the model examples. This is the basic design of the building itself. Uh, this is what was, uh, you know, uh, approved originally in 2020. Uh, it's the it's the facade brick. the The metal on the right is just showing you what the mansard will be clad in. It's a standing seam metal. Um, there was a question in regards to the window on the north side on the second floor. Um, 
the applicant, the owner, work with staff to kind of modify that. And now staff is okay with the, uh, the appearance of this window. It's a little bit different than the windows in the front. It's a little bit street visible. So we were concerned about it, but the applicant has agreed to modify it slightly. So staff is okay with that. And here's other examples. And it, it this is showing you there are other examples of mansards that have different style windows on the sides. And in the middle is where we're at now with the uh, proposal and that window. Jan worked with them a lot with this. So this is, this is Jan's uh, project. She did a great job getting this through. There's more details for you. Here is in, in perspective. So given that um, it has support from the neighborhood as submitted with small changes, still has support from the alderman, um, uh, CO recommends that the board grant preliminary approval for the new construction with stipulation that final drawings, windows, extra materials, and colors be reviewed and approved by CRO. Thank you. Questions of staff? Is the applicant present? I, I do not believe so. I think Mr. Colleen. Uh, yes, yes, oh, sir. Oh, he is. There he is. Yeah. Hey. Evening. Good evening. Did you did you hear staff presentation? Yes, I did. Did you hear anything that alarmed you? Nothing at all. Did you do you tend to agree with the recommendation? Yeah, yes, I do agree with it. If we have questions, can you answer them? I probably can. Okay. Um, <laughs> Commissioner. <laughs> depends on how detailed they are. Commissioner yes. Hamilton always has a question about new construction <laughs> that she thinks is cute. <laughs> okay. I don't have a question, I have a motion. Okay, then. This is a hard one. I'm just kidding. No. Uh, my <laughs> motion is that the Preservation Board grant preliminary uh, approval to the project with the condition that the final drawing windows, exterior materials, and colors be reviewed and approved by Cultural Resources Office. I second that. Motion's made and seconded. Is there any discussion? Hearing none, I'm going to call a roll. Commissioner Hamilton, do you vote yes? Yes. Commissioner Gilbert, do you vote yes? Yes. Or no? <laughs> Commissioner Robinson, do you vote yes or no? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Commissioner, let's see. Chair abstains on this. There are three yeses and one abstention. The motion carries. Thank you, guys. Thank you, commissioners. Okay. Thank you. As unlikely as it sounds, the final agenda item 4339, 4359. <coughs> Okay. This is our, our last hour and a half of meeting. We... <laughs> okay. Good evening, everyone. I'm Meg Lusto with the Cultural Resources Office, and this is the preliminary review for the proposed new construction at 4339 and 4359 Lindell Boulevard, better known as the Engineers Club. Um, the Engineers Club at 4339 and 4359, they does a cross property line. So they own two lots. This is two lots and the proposal is for two lots. Uh, the building was designed by prominent St. Louis firm of Russell, Mulgart, Schwartz and Van Hoven in 1965 in the modern expressionist style. It's been determined through survey and evaluation to be one of the most significant buildings of the mid-century modern style in St. Louis. The current application proposes to leave intact the existing building, which includes the auditorium on the west, as well as the one-story Eastern section and connect them to a newly constructed L-shaped multifamily six-story apartment building with interior parking. The new building would abut the original um, building to the East via a connecting one-story hyphen then wrap around the original building on the North re North side. Um, the site plan gives you a little bit better idea. A resubdivision to consolidate the lots into a single parcel would be required as the project would span both the 4339 Lindell and 4359 Lindell parcels. And the properties are located within the boundaries of the Central West End Certified Local Historic District, which has standards for new construction. And those are the standards that we use to evaluate the proposed new construction. So first, a few photographs of the um, existing site. I'm sure you all know where it is, uh, here on Lindell, <laughs> next to Rosati Kane, in fact. Um, some additional details, the exteriors, some context, that's context north, context south and across the street, also across the street. So 
Um, <clears throat> again, we use the Central West End standards when evaluating the new construction. And when it comes to height, scale, and mass, the building partially complies. Proposed six-story L-shaped addition appears to fall under the high-rise category, although there are a number of taller buildings in the 4300 block of Lindell, including a 22-story apartment building at Lindell and North Newstead. The 4200 block has somewhat smaller, though varied, scale. On the west, the one-story Engineers Club, another one-story, and Rosati Kane High School, an overscaled three-story structure. To the east of the project, there are three two-story buildings and a contemporary one-story bank at North Boyle. The opposite streetscape comprises two and a half and three story residential stru three story structures and a large four story apartment complex. Um, the revised design pays particular attention to the integration of a comparatively large scale building into the, con into the context of a smaller one story engineers club and to respecting its unusual architectural form and detailing. Um, location, uh, this goes to whether there's a rhythm of um, facade setbacks or setbacks on the block. The building widths and spacing on this block of Lindell are irregular, so there's no existing rhythm to maintain. And the new structure would match the setback of the existing engineers club. So that line here is maintained. Exterior materials complies. The dominant exterior materials would be brick and stucco, characteristic of the street. The upper story, which is recessed from the main block would be sheathed and dark metal panels. Fenestration appears to comply. Curb cuts. Uh, complies, entry to the below grade parking, and other services would be from the alley and an existing curb cut on Lindell would be removed. Coordination with and approval from other departments for the alley curb cut may be needed. In terms of coordination with form-based zoning, the project complies with the building development component of the Central West End form-based code as reviewed by Cultural Resources Office staff. Um, I would like to note one element that we overlooked that the Central West End Planning and Development Committee uh, did remind us of, and this was in your packet, but um, when I get to the recommendations, we do want to include the retention of this integrated um, planter and stair system in the front. So preliminary findings and conclusion. Uh, 4339 Lindell and 4359 Lindell are located in the Central West End Historic District. The Engineers Club was designed by the prominent St. Louis firm of Russell, Mulgart, Schwartz, and Van Hoven in 1965 at the modern expressionist style, and was one of the 25 top examples of high architectural significance in the 2013 survey of the city's mid-century modern architecture. It is eligible for individual listing in the National Register of Historic Places. The current proposal includes rehabilitation and reuse of the entire Engineers Club. A six-story apartment block would wrap around the Engineers Club, on the east and north connected only by a small one-story hyphen structure. The exterior of the building would remain intact. Uh, a resubdivision of the lots at 4339 and 4359 Lindell into a single parcel would be required. Uh, we note that the Central West End Planning and Development Committee has offered conditional support of the project. And I heard today from Andrew Weil of uh, Landmarks of St. Louis that they are in concurrence with the Central West End position. Um, the applicants have worked with the Cultural Resources Office to refine their original proposal to both retain the historic building and develop a complementary design for the large structure that will not overwhelm or obscure it, but allow the Engineers Club to be understood in its original structural form. Based on these preliminary findings, the Cultural Resources Office recommends that the Preservation Board grant preliminary approval for the project with the condition that final details, plans, and exterior materials be reviewed and approved by the Cultural Resources Office. Commissioners, questions of staff? Uh, yeah, Meg, Mike here, questions. So um, the form-based code um, item that you mentioned, so th there was some something that you all approved, but did it go through the zoning review yet? On yeah, it's gone, it's gone to zoning. We we are only responsible for what are the chapters. It's kind of complicated procedurally, but that's what we've reviewed and that's that's been our conclusion. It's past your office and zoning's office? It's past our office. Well, we, we have reviewed it for compliance with our section, yes. Oh, but, but we don't know if zoning has? Um, we are only speaking about what we have done. So how does it work in the form-based district? Like, so who checks that box? It says, it says zoning took care of it. It's got to go back to zoning. So it could get preliminary approval here and get rejected by them still for form-based code? In theory, um, we're just, we're only commenting on our role here. Okay. And they still need to look at that curb cut you mentioned from the alley too. Uh, I'm not sure. I would have to defer to them on that. 
Oh, I thought you mentioned that. Okay, thank you. No, no, I, I did. I'm just, I'm not sure if it's zoning or if it's another, another um, maybe board of public service. I'm just not sure about the curb cut issue. Okay, thanks, Mike. Further questions for staff? Meg, is it your testimony that this proposal will not jeopardize or endanger an important historic building in the city of St. Louis? Um, it barely touches the existing building. So the existing building, which is our priority, is um, protected in that way. And the design lets the original structure be the focus of the overall project. Okay, let me ask you the question again. Is it your testimony that this construction will not endanger this historic building? Yes. Thank you. Um, okay. I have a question uh, oh, for the director. You clarified that the, the planter, that the Central West End Historic District commented on will remain, but it doesn't look like it's in the rendering. So I just want to clarify, which way is it? We we are recommending that that be part of the approval, that it remain, even though it's not part of the proposal. Got it. Thank Sorry you. I wasn't clear on that. Further questions? Commissioner Robinson? Commissioner Colleen? No, no, sir. Okay. Let's hear from the applicant. Sorry, Chairman. Um, so I, I can make it brief. We, we've been working with uh, cultural resources, the neighborhood. Um, we've held, uh, I think, two or three neighborhood meetings here um, with the aldermen and, um, and the Engineer Society. I think uh, somebody's here from the Engineer Society as well uh, to speak. We originally had um, a previous proposal that I think we put in front of the Preservation Board um, that called for uh, modifying the existing structure. Uh, we took the feedback from uh, this board and cultural resources office and went back and, and revised our proposal to, um, you know, pay close attention to your, your concerns regarding maintaining um, the integrity of the building and also reducing the height of the new construction proposal. Our original proposal had the height of the new construction apartment community being much larger and overwhelming um, the original structure. So we took that feedback. Um, and, and spent a lot of time revising it. We work with Mr. Dwyer. Um, uh, uh, we probably bothered Mr. Dwyer a bunch uh, trying to uh, make sure that we satisfied uh, his committee's concern regarding the brick colors and making sure that they match with uh, the existing um, engineer structure so that the, the, new, the new building had complementary colors. Um, that did take quite some time because uh, we, we couldn't find something that, that um, was available and that also satisfied a lot of the requirements of the committee, but we finally did come um, to a solution that I think has made uh, cultural resources, um, Mr. Dwyer's group and, and, and the neighborhood happy. So, um, um, and, and finally, I think one of the other main concerns was removing the curb cuts on Lindell. Um, and we've also removed those access points on Lindell. So I think all of these things have, have brought us to a, a project that I think everyone is really happy with. Mike, do you want to add something? Yeah, let me say a couple of things. Um, it's Mike Burkhardt, I swear to tell the truth. Um, all right, so, you know, in, in odd, our oddly, design, oddly, we don't require you to tell the truth for preliminary reviews. <laughs> they're, okay. they're, they're, they're just courtesies. All right. Hey, um, now we, we, we've been in this process for quite a while as far as, you know, going through different design iterations. And, you know, the result is we, we the, the portion that, extends out to Lundell at one time was a story higher, um, you know, just because of the um, surrounding buildings. So we did drop it off, drop off a story. We, we used to have a taller architectural element that was called a fin that kind of came up. And I believe um, the Central West End planning and development community didn't really like that. We removed that, you know, we, um, um, you know, just trying to bring the scale of the building back, like Sid said, by, you know, setting back, you know, the, the top. Um, we've also taken into consideration, you know, construction of the building in regards to, you know, the um, Engineers Club building. We, we will have a connection, but the connection's only um, just kind of like a breezeway between the new building and the, um, and the Engineers Club. So we're leaving ourselves room for shoring so we can safely do those things without 
you know, damaging, you know, damaging the structure. So, you know, that's been, been considered as well as, as we do the garage, you know, that, that's going to be below grade. So, um, as far as zoning approval, um, you know, we have been working with Terrell um, in a lot of detail. We, um, we had a meeting with um, Mary Hart Burton, we have, and, and basically we believe we comply with all, um, with all the form-based code standards. Um, the, only, the only item they were waiting on was a, um, um, a statement from cultural resources, which maybe, you know, this meeting could provide. Um, you know, just to con confirm that cultural resources have their comments, which is part of their zoning, and then and then per their uh, per the meeting, they're ready to approve the uh, the zoning this time. So, anyway, um, you know, we could go through the building, but Meg's done a great job already, and um, we'll just let you guys ask questions. And one one thing I will mention is keeping the stair intact. You know, at the front, you know, will not be a problem at all. That's that can easily be done, and it's actually a great idea. So, I think that's pretty much um, pretty much it, um, except one thing. And um, Mr. Dryer, you mentioned in your letter, you know, that we would do a mock-up wall, and we're definitely in full agreement with that. You know, we we were out on site um, with Meg and Jan with like eight or ten brick samples and. You know, it's very difficult to get a brick that, um, you know, that complements, you know, the the slate, you know, which is very prominent, kind of a greenish color, and most of the bricks are have more of a bluish tint. So, you know, we we did find one that we think does does work, but you know, we're definitely going to want to, you know, get a mock up wall and 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 be, uh, give that attention. So, we we do intend to do that. Commissioners, questions for the applicants? Okay, Meg, who's here to speak? Uh, we have two speakers, but before we get to that, I just want to mention that we also received a letter of support from Alderman Jesse Todd, in whose ward this sits. So our first speaker is Melissa Carver. Good evening. Thank you for allowing me to speak tonight. Hello, thank you for your patience. Yeah, no problem. It sounds like I, I will tell the truth, but maybe I don't have to say I'm going to tell the truth, but I promise <laughs> to tell the truth. <laughs> okay, and you do not have to say so. Okay. I, I, um, I am so. pretty confident that nobody in the last 45 minutes has told the whole truth. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody just wants to have dinner, right? <laughs> That's correct. <laughs> um, so anyway, thanks for allowing me to speak today. I'm here uh, to speak on behalf of the Engineers Club and the Engineering Center. I'm currently serving as the president of these organizations. Um, we did speak, uh, this has been going, as you guys know, this has been ongoing for a year and a half um, with this site, trying to work through a plan, a meanable plan uh, for all. So I won't, I won't spend too much time here, but um, just kind of wanted to reiterate, actually a lot of what Meg said. Um, we've been working and, and Vic's kept us, Vic and Sid with Lux has also kept us in the, the loop as well on this. And, you know, this, 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 this building is architecturally significant. We understand that. Um, it also has a, an emotional tie to a lot of our members. So the fact that they could leave the structure untouched and still preserve that building um, really means a lot to our organization and the engineering community. Um, we've been around for 150 years. Uh, we can't stay in this building. Financially, we can't. Um, we've got $750,000. This was as of a year and a half ago. So it's more than that now in deferred maintenance, just alone on this. Um, we used to have 2,400 members. Now we're down to 600 members. Um, we you know, took out some loans to do the remodels on this building about six or seven years ago and you know, did, just a, did a really great job on one wing with the intent of running the facility. Um, that was good for a couple of years and then COVID hit. And that really, really stopped our, the profitability of our organization to, to keep going. Um, so I just wanted to, to say thanks to everyone so far who's been going through and listening to us um, because we, we, can't, we can't stay in the facility. Um, and the sale is really imperative to us to continue our mission in the community and the engineering world here. 
So um, I'll stop there, but um, thanks for your time. Really appreciate it. Thank you. Meg, who's next? Next is Jim Dwyer. Okay, Mr. Dwyer. Mr. Kello, so back again. Um, I'll be brief. I will say that I this feels like unfamiliar territory. It feels like a bit of a mutual admiration society uh, that we're a part of now, all of us. But I will say that this is, I think, a great example of how the process can work. And uh, the diff I'm, I'm basing that on where we started with the initial presentation on this property and where we have wound up. So the, the Planning and Development Committee considers this to be a successful outcome. Um, we believe that um, the proposed new construction will be complementary to that which exists. And we believe that the preservation of the existing building uh, has been accomplished at least in terms of this agreement. Uh, there are a couple of conditions that are recited in the correspondence that should be on the record, in your record, uh, dated December 5th. We did not learn until Friday afternoon that this property or this project was going to be on your agenda today. So we had to um, regroup <clears throat> on short notice. Um, we had originally proposed four conditions to the approval, and those are simply one, strict adherence to all details, design and materials of the final design, two, ongoing review of all details, excuse me, <clears throat> and approval by CRO of proposed site improvements in front of the building line of both the existing and proposed new, new structures. And that's the area where we had to regroup on Friday afternoon. Uh, and I'll come back to that in a second. Point three, removal of existing curb cuts and prohibition on the introduction of new curb cuts along Lindell Boulevard, that has been agreed to. Item four, presentation of a large scale brick and mortar sample panel has been agreed to as well. So now the critical part, and we're looking at the rendering that is important to this part of the, the conversation. So one of our committee members, Bill Seibert, is the one who recognized that the assembly of the stairs and the wing walls and the planter beds on either side of the stairs were a critical piece of the overall composition and should be uh, treated as such and preserved. And so we made that case to in our letter that is in your possession. And I just want to read into the record two sentences that I think are critical. Um, the earth terrace, the steps, the brick and slate planter boxes, the concrete walkway, and this is the important part, and the building entry are distinguishing features of the design by Russell Mogart, Schwarz and Van Hoven and should be preserved intact. The proposed design as shown in the rendering that we not this one, but the ones that we have been looking at, um, show all of those historic elements being removed and that a, a new recreational slash gathering zone, that's my description, is proposed for the terrace area in front of the historic building. We believe that neither action is appropriate, neither the removal of the historic elements nor the introduction of a recreational slash gathering zone in front of the building is appropriate for that site. And that we would uh, propose or recommend that um, the plans be modified accordingly. And that completes my testimony. Thank you. Is there anybody else? Uh, yes, I have a question for Mr. Dwyer. Yes. May I? Yeah, um, Jim, um, do, do you have any clue? Did the um, applicant tell you why this was? Uh, it, it seems to be a little bit rushed. If if you guys got notice that it, it was applied for so late in the deal and you had to scramble after so much work together. 
Well, the way I found out about it is that I knew that this was coming down the pike, so to speak. And so I prepared a letter for cultural resources, not for the preservation board. Uh, and then when that letter was presented just coincidentally uh, on Friday, uh, that's when Meg advised me that this matter had been added to the agenda. So I wouldn't have known otherwise if that's, if that address, if that's responsive to your question. Yeah, and uh, Mr. Chairman, I don't know if we can ask that question of, of the owner here. What is the rush after so much work, or is that just not an issue I can ask? You know, it's, it is the last thing that we're going to hear after a relatively long meeting. I would like to give you the latitude to ask that question. Okay. So wh why, yes, do you understand the question? Um, I'm pu putting that to the owner of this property. Sure, I, I I think I understand the question. I can I can try to answer it the best possible. We've been we've been trying to uh, we we have an agreement with the engineers uh, group that that um, the the group that currently owns the property that we are going to proceed with uh, bringing this back through the preservation board. We have been working in earnest with the neighborhood association and Mr. Dwyer um, to get his uh, su support and approval. Um, and working with cultural resources in parallel. Uh, to answer your question why it's taken the period of time to get it on the agenda, I, I couldn't exactly answer that outside of the fact that um, it's been our intention to get it on the agenda as quickly as possible with the neighborhood support board. Okay, because I just remember the last time you were here, we suggested that you go back and talk to the neighborhood and get all your ducks in a row. And it just seems like, wow, you did that. And then why rush it at the end? I, I just don't follow the logic of that. We have we have a very I mean we've already extended this contract pretty substantially to get time to go revise it and and uh, get the neighborhood support with multiple iterations. I mean it did not come over a short period of time. Um, I'm sure Mr. Dwyer can attest to that. We've spent a lot of time with them and his group getting to a, a program that everyone approves. But um, the Engineer Society is also needing us to move quickly because um, they need to sell the property. Okay, thank you. Do, do you agree to Mr. Dwyer's four conditions? Yes, sir. We do. All of them? Yes, sir. Okay. We agree to all the conditions in totality. Okay, commissioners, that seems to conclude the testimony in this matter. Yes, Meg. Uh, John Warren has now asked to speak. Okay. Hi, uh, John Warren here. I'm the listing broker uh, with Cushman and Wakefield. I've uh, represented the Engineers Club for the last um, several years. And I just want to stress that this is um, the, the second buyer. Um, Lux Living has been more than, than upfront in working together with not only the Cultural Resources Office, uh, but also the Engineers Club, um, working with Jim Dwyer and the Central West End Planning and Development Committee and really kind of trying to figure out the best absolute solution for this site, preserving the building in its entirety. Initially John, was- um, for a second? Yes. You want us to approve this? Yes, sir. Okay, stop talking. <laughs> Please proceed. Thank you. <laughs> okay, between Commissioner Killeen and Commissioner Hamaker, can you state a motion? Well, I've got one, but Catherine, would you like to take it? Sure. I make a motion that the Preservation Board grant preliminary approval of the proposed new construction to surround the High Merit Engineers Club um, with the stipulation that final plans and exterior materials be approved by the Cultural Resources Office and that those four items that Mr. Dwyer mentioned are incorporated. And I would add contingent upon final approval of zoning for the form based code. I, I, I think that's outside. I, I, we don't have control over. I, well, I retract that. I retract that. Is it automatically contingent? Yeah, I, I, that's what I was thinking. If we don't have control over that approval, but you know it. But I, I I'm just going to retract that. And are we tying this to a building permit, Mike? Sorry, can you say that one more time? Uh, are we tying this to a building permit? Well, they're not tearing anything down. They're attaching something too. 
Yeah. Well, yeah, I don't think the inspectors would let them do anything without a permit anyway. Ha ha ha. No, I'm not trying to be a wise guy, but I'm just trying to picture a demo is one thing, but. Okay, it's fine. Yeah, I think we're good without a permit. Yes, sir. Perfect. Any further discussion? Hearing none, we'll call a roll. <laughs> Commissioner Hamilton, you yes. vote yes or no? Yes. <laughs> what was the first thing you said? It was yes, a tired yes. Yes, okay. yes, 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 yes. <laughs> okay, that counts as one vote. Commissioner Gilbert, yes or no? Yes. Commissioner Robinson, yes or no? Yes. Commissioner Colleen, yes or no? Yes. Chair abstains on this vote. There are four yeses, one abstention, and the motion carries. Commissioners, do I hear a motion to adjourn? No, motion to adjourn. <laughs> Second. ASAP, right now. I'll see you <laughs> people on the 29th. The objection. We, stand, we stand adjourned. Thank you, commissioners. Thank you. Thank Happy you. holidays. Thank you all. <laughs> Thank you. Stop screen share. Is that thing recording on yours? Yeah. Okay. Can someone come over here?